<laughs> we are live here at Bad City Comic Professionals. It is Sunday night, which means it's time to wind down your weekend. As always, I'm your host, Shannon, a.k.a. Small Press Shan. And returning back with me this week is the wonderful Wednesday Phil. I love that that sounds like the wonderful Wizard of Oz. I'm going to just say it like that from now on. Um, Phil, we haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. What have you been up to? Working. It's my whole life. Is working for the man. Working for the man. That's all I do. Do you like play like everybody's working no, for the no. weekend in your like little shorts and stuff? Phil works for FedEx if you don't know. <laughs> well, here's the thing. FedEx doesn't get the little shorts. Oh, right. You don't get the little shorts. You have the regular length shorts, uh, yeah, right? I have big baggy shorts <laughs> with lots of pockets. They're like cargo shorts for all the stuff I have to put in there. Uh, no, I, I listen to a lot of black metal at work. And I'm driving fast through neighborhoods and throwing packages at doors, <laughs> just not caring. No, but you know, yeah, it's it's been busy. I've been working on some things, podcasting and whatnot. So, you know, the usual. Yeah. Sweet. Well, we're happy to have you back. Um, there's a lot of good... We were just talking about how many great comics there were this week. Yeah. And how we were like, oh, man, even though it was kind of a light week, everything, like, rose to the occasion of being featured this week, so... I was... I'm usually concerned when I miss a few weeks where I come back and I'm like, oh, I probably everything... Because I was even looking on the shows and, like, Superman's already at issue four. Yeah. And there's all these things that have already, like... And I'm just like, okay, hopefully I didn't miss too much. But this week, you know, I, I, I was pretty happy with how much was out there. I was like, okay, cool. I, I've read most of this. Yes. I know. You're going to have to, like, call in sick one day and just sit there and read comics to catch up with all the greatness that the indie small press world is giving us right now. Well, I mean, I am off for for Memorial Day tomorrow, so... There you go. I'll just come open the shop. <laughs> the shop is not open uh, for Memorial Day tomorrow because it's Monday and we're always closed on Mondays. But, well, I'll open it but... <laughs> and I'll read all the books and then anyone that comes in, there will be a sale. <laughs> no. If you are watching at home right now, do not show up tomorrow. <laughs> the store is not open. <laughs> um, but uh, we will see you on Wednesday and Phil will just take books home and read them and catch up. Uh, so, yeah, and we're, we're, re we're drinking this Wine. This is not the one you brought. I know you did. You remembered to bring a wine, and I still opened the wrong one because That's you okay. remembered. But this is uh, William Wright. It's a hand selected Pinot Noir. Hmm. I don't really know. It's from uh, it's from California. It says it's got smooth tannins and a silky texture, so not like rough tannins, which you don't like at all. Um, says it's supposed to go good with fish appetizers and cheese, which I mean, it goes with cheese. So I love cheese, and I. Uh, I thought last time, though, when Anthony was here, I determined I was a white wine person. We did determine you're a white wine person. I need to start bringing my own bottle. Yeah, you do. You should bring your own white wine, and then we can talk about your wine versus my wine, and that would be amazing. Um, and, like, I'll take a drink of yours, and you can take a drink of mine, and then we'll be like, ooh, this is why I don't drink that. I need one of those fancy uh, ice buckets. Mm -hmm. like, I need, like, a fancy ice bucket. Well, when I had my uh, educator, when we had our educator seminar and we had wines, I actually just put, we have like a little plastic heart that we serve chips in usually. I filled that with ice and yeah. then just stuck the white wine in there for a while and mm. it was cute. So we'll just put the little heart bucket over here for you. Okay. Or the Superman bucket. We have a Superman bucket. Look, Matt was already there. <laughs> I know where it is. I'm like. There you go, oh, you Superman bucket, and you can have your white wine during the show. That'll be great. Um, I'm super stoked for that now because, yay, Phil will find <laughs> one that he likes. Um, I guess I'll put this this way because I know you're not going to refill your glass. That'll be all you. <laughs> um, uh, but just so you, like, if you're watching and you want to know, I think this is delicious. Um, it's not bad. It's, I go, the I like red wine based on how much heartburn I have. Yeah. And I have very little heartburn with this one. It doesn't have, it, maybe that's the smoothness of, like, the smooth tannin thing, but it doesn't have that strong of, like, a punch with the flavor. You know, I can't tell you, like, this is blackberry or this is this right. flavor, um, which I don't even know if it says. Like, it, no, it's, like, red cherry. It's red cherry and blackberry with a little bit of vanilla, but Sweet. I I can't actually taste I like a, a consistent one of mm -hmm. any of those in this one. I so. never can, honestly, though. <laughs> Like, when you read the backs, and you're like, oh, it's got plums and this and that. I'm like, I just taste wine. You just taste wine. Yeah. I just <laughs> it, taste whatever that wine flavor is. I guess it does have more of a cherry than a grape kind of taste to it, though. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah. Um, 
Anyway, that's what we're drinking. We're drinking William, right? If you're uh, partaking in anything, even if it's water at home, we definitely want to hear about it. And we want to hear all about the books that you're reading this week as we go along and talk about everything that's happening. Uh, it's been a great week at Bad City. We've had so many people come out. It's such an amazing time. I'm like, so many things were happening and everything. Um, but I do know... I have an announcement I think I can make. Um, we always talk about our buddies over at Mysterium Escape Rooms over in Sarasota. And if they're, I know they're probably streaming this live in there right now. But they opened their newest escape room, which is called, I'm going to get it wrong, but it is a Wizarding World theme. Oh, That's, not the, the Freak Show one? No, not the Freak Show one. That one is okay. coming soon still, but mm. they opened um, the Wizarding World new escape room it's on the third floor it's going to be super cool um i'm very excited cannot wait to go check it out um nick if you are watching please throw in the actual name but it is uh, open for booking now and i'm i'm so excited because we haven't seen the third floor of mysterium yet this is going to be a new escape area for them um and and also i just i want to see what they what they put together because everything they put together they're so solid you know it's going to be a fun time I didn't even know they had a second floor. Yeah, they haven't used the second floor yet either. Hmm. So I think second floor has been kind of like, and third have kind of been like reserved and like for offices and oh, future okay. escape rooms. But now um, the third floor has finally launched with the first of many to come, I'm sure, escape rooms on the additional floors. And uh, Memorial Day is tomorrow. They are open and you can go check out the new escape room or any of the other three escape rooms that they have. Uh, which is like Area 941, Tiki yeah. Trouble, Wild Wild West. Um, I know you've done Tiki Trouble. I still can't wait to tackle Area 941 because it's such a cool room. That's the one I, I want to do. Last time I was in there after we did, because Nick always recommends Tiki Trouble is the one to start with. Yeah. Um, and so after that, I was like, okay, the next one has to be yes. Area 941. I know. It's so cool in there. I love it. I still want to do the show live from inside of 941, and I can't say that it will never happen because I would love to go back and do that sometime soon. Where we review comics while solving puzzles? I mean, I don't know if we're going to solve the puzzles, but we're going to do it on, like, the bridge of the ship okay. that exists inside there. So, um, But we'll see. Um, and speaking of talking about comics, we're going to jump into talking about this week's comics because there are so many good ones. I know we're going to end up talking about them way way long times so we're gonna kick it off with indigo children number three from image comics um if you have not jumped into indigo children this is it's kind of your sci-fi adventure story that's kind of almost seeming like building up your your team of people right now almost like your superhero team or or your adventure team uh but we found out in the very first issue that there were these kids who were experimented on given all these superpowers essentially each one got one power of certain kind and now these kids have all been made to forget and they are all spread out across the world none of them have any idea this is happening and indigo prime who is the first of the indigo children has now opened up to finding all of those people again and they're all coming back together and we don't really know why there's something like we're gonna take on like we're gonna take down the man or something going on here um but each issue we are introduced to a new one of the indigo children as they come to collect that person kind of like in oceans 11 where you see what that person does and then you know danny shows up to recruit them to the team this is kind of where we at, are at right now on this adventure um but we did just for the first time in this issue learn that not all of the indigo children uh are excited to do things for the betterment of people some of them are actually on the side of the bad guys and we're gonna see possibly some armies of indigo children grow up in opposite directions as we come towards this next issue and the possibly at least a cliffhanger towards the end of an arc one maybe a whole arc. I would imagine this would end up being a 12-part series at the least uh, because it, we are only on issue three, but I don't feel like we're going to wrap everything up in two issues, but who knows? Um, check it out if you are looking for something that's got superpowers but are more um, not geared towards like a superpowered story. Um, and up next, uh, we've got Kara, Guardian of the Realms, 
issue four from Vizier Entertainment, which is one of our newest publishers that we talk about. They they just recently came in. Like, February was their very first book, and we're already on issue four of it. So that's amazing that they are having that fast of a turnaround for issues for um, a new publisher. But Kara is the story of a young girl who lives in a special realm where all of these animals are kept safe and she is kind of, she is the guardian of them. So she has the ability to talk to different animals and help them along. And in the very first issue, we saw two boys inside of a spaceship come through a time travel bubble and land inside of her realm. This is the first issue where those two paths actually intersect and we finally see those boys run into Kara. And Kara has just had her first ever experience with humans in the last couple of issues and learning that humans aren't as bad as she's kind of been taught to believe they were her whole life. And so she's met these people and she's kind of torn on, do I want to help them? Do they mean well? Or are are we being used and they're coming after my animals? But she has learned that the future does not contain any animals. And so if she has to work with them to save every animal in the world, she's kind of willing to do whatever she can to protect her friends. It's a beautiful book. Um, honestly, I know issue one was a pick of the week. I think issue two was as well. Honestly, this could have easily been a pick of the week. This is one of the most gorgeous uh, storytelling books that we have right now. And the art is always so beautiful. I just, um, if you are an adult reader, you're going to love this. But if you have kid readers in your life, this is a perfect one. We have three kid subscribers for this book. Um, already and every time they come in and they talk about it other people are like what was that book that they were just talking about and um, we have a, a father and daughter who get this book together actually we have two fathers and daughters that get this book together and read it together so um, I think it's really cool that it's a book that brings the adults and the kids both to read together yeah I mean the art on this book is it's probably one of the best books art wise on the shelves right now I think and I've always been a big fan of like all ages fantasies mm -hmm. and I think this just adds to the already great list of those books um, so I'm happy that this book is coming out and I hope this is just ongoing for ever and ever yeah yeah um, up next we have terror war issue two from image comics and I know you were really excited about issue one when it came out so tell us what <clears throat> issue two is about Phil so this is uh, in a world where instead of the Ghostbusters fighting ghosts, teams of mercenaries are battling uh, fear-based monsters. It's like the Stay Puff Man, but all different forms, and they're derived from the fears that people have. And so in that first issue, we're introduced to this main team, you know, kind of your ragtag, down on their luck. They're not the best at their job. <laughs> Um, but they get by and they're good at what they do and at the end of that first issue they take on um, one of the fear monsters but at the end of the issue this other team shows up and it's like well I think we're gonna take your bounty for this one and so this issue picks right where that left off we have them fighting this other team kind of like warrior style <laughs> you know where there's like there's no real consequences no one's gonna be killed they're just kind of like punching and and fighting for this bounty uh, and the team that we love ends up losing and they end up going to a club to blow off some steam and just enjoy their night and they run into this fire-based fear monster and it's more powerful than they're used to seeing it's gotten way out of hand and our team is like oh no this is it this is how we go out but the team that they were scrapping with earlier shows up to save the day um, I think this is a fun book. Uh, I mean, I love Ghostbusters as a kid, and this gives me kind of all those vibes. You don't have the same, like, quippy characters that you had in Ghostbusters. It's a bit more serious. Um, I think as these issues go on, we're going to see more of the backstories of these characters. We're kind of seeing them on the surface as we build this world outwards. Um, but I love the concept of like monsters that are derived from your biggest fears um, because I think there's a lot of really fun, interesting things that you can do with that. You can also at some point, very much like Ghostbusters, bring in like a very popular character that somebody is really afraid of. Like you can really play with this medium. Uh, but I, I think it's I think it's been a ton of fun in these first two issues. Absolutely, and the colors on that book are gorgeous. Yeah, I was actually thinking about who the the colorist was, Walter Pereira. Yeah, Pereira. Okay. 
Yeah, great colors, Walter. You're you really are bringing it to life. It's kind of like Slumber, which was yeah, you know, the detective story in the dream world. I think when you have a dream world story, you really have to give those bright, enthusiastic yes. colors because there is, you know, if you have all of somebody's imagination at your disposal, it's gonna have all of the spectrum of the mm-hmm. rainbow underneath it. So. Um, in addition to Kara, we have Changelings issue four from Busy Eight Entertainment. Both of those books have had the same release schedule and have just been, again, phenomenal. This one, honestly, again, could have easily been a pick of the week. Um, Busy Eight Entertainment is just crushing it as a new publisher. But this story is all about the Changelings. The, the, there is a, a child who is born on Earth who is replaced with a child from a magical realm, and it's kind of that restore the balance situation. But we are given, in this particular time, we are given the the child who is sort of the protector, the one who uses their magic for good, and the human child is sent to this dark world, and they actually learn all of the dark magic and become evil. And in this issue, we actually find out that this has been going on for centuries. Generations of people have had this exact exact battle. They've been trying to stop each other from destroying the world, and they do that by fighting for these totems. And if any of them get all five totems, they have ultimate power. Of course, the good one never wants to do that, but the bad one is always trying to do this. So we're kind of seeing almost like a an, an avatar, like Ong versus Zuko kind of situation where you've got your good and your bad, and maybe they'll come and learn to work together, but we have create these giant monsters. The other part of the changeling is that they have the power to take tiny creatures and turn them into behemoths or kaijus and fight against each other. And so in this particular issue, we actually not only got that backstory, but we start to, we flip to the, to where we are now and we see how far into this battle we've become and how dark and dangerous it might be going forward in this story. Um, it's such a beautiful, beautiful tale. Um, both Kara and, and Changelings, like if you told me these were old mythological stories that they translated into comic books, I would 100% believe you because they're such strong, mythology uh the mythos is so strong within them and the the storytelling is so rich that it feels like somebody's been telling this story for generations um and it's gorgeous yeah busy eight's been putting out great books absolutely um up next we have quested issue six from whatnot publishing this is uh, this is John Boy Meyer's cover, by the way. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> um, this is a a story for for those of you who are into the like Kyle Starks kind of storytelling, um, and kind of the I hate Fairyland kind of worlds. So this is the story of a young man who is lives in a fantasy world, and he's the son of a king who was killed, and he's kind of used all of his his power. Um, to to go off and scam people. He's just been scamming everybody forever. And the very first one is kind of a play on the Mario thing, so we get a lot of video game homage covers and everything. In the Sorry, Your Princess is in Another Castle, he's basically turned that into a scam. And he's sending letters to kings and saying, oh, somebody's threatening your princess. Like, I've come to offer my team. Like, we're going to sub out, like, my person pretending to be the princess, and when they get kidnapped, like, we'll save them. Like, we'll destroy them. We'll be able to trace them back. And we kind of saw that happen in the first couple issues. And then we went off on like some tangents and he was not questing in that particular way. And now it's all circled back around to that now because he has been discovered to be a fraud. But in the process of being discovered, the person who is hunting him down, who is a detective kaiju, by the way, and I was like, oh my God, detective kaiju needs his own spinoff. Uh, somebody give me that book immediately. But he has been caught and now they know that he is up to no good. But Detective Kaiju has revealed that there actually might be a non-dead father situation going on here. And so all this time that he's been doing all these things thinking, like, because he feels bad about the fact that, like, his dad died and he has nothing, uh, there might actually be a chance that he could very well save his dad. So this story is definitely jumping into a whole new world. But when we get into issue seven, and I can't wait to see if he actually has a growth arc because he's kind of a deplorable character right now, and I think it's time for him to to learn and grow. Talk about great colors. Oh, I know it's such a vibrant oh book. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand you this book before I take that drink. Um, up next, we have all eight eyes issue two from Dark Horse Comics. <laughs> yes, uh, if you're a fan of the movie Eight Legged Freaks, then. 
think of this as the a bit more serious version of Eight Legged Freaks. Uh, this is in a world where giant spiders have been around for a very, very long time, and they've been hiding in the shadows and kind of it feels like slowly taking over the world, mm-hmm. maybe possibly. Uh, and in the first issue, we are introduced to uh, a, a young uh, queer punk kid named Vin. And he's kind of down on his luck. He gets kicked out of his apartment and is trying to figure out what to do. And he runs into this old homeless man named Reynolds and his adorable dog, Possum. Oh my god, I love Possum. And discover that this guy is basically going around and single-handedly battling giant spiders. Um, And in that first issue, he's like, all right, I guess I'll team up with you. I've got nothing else going on. Uh, in this issue, we see Vin trying to convince one of his friends that he's not on drugs and that he's actually battling giant spiders with a homeless man, which, of course, the friend's like, no, okay, stop lying to me. Like, just when you're done with whatever this binge is, falling off the wagon, you know, come talk to me. Uh, and then they get wind of uh, Reynolds' uh, white whale spider, like the one that he's been on the hunt for. Uh, and it could be in an abandoned school, which also happens to now be possibly part of some, like, skeezy political deal with the Parks and Recreation uh, Department, who's like, oh, we're going to sell this, and it's going to help boost our our political power. And so uh, things are, at the end, by the end of this issue, looks like things are about to get out of hand. Um, One thing that I do love is that they kind of have that very much like Men in Black style um, storytelling where it's like, oh, there's a part of the world that knows what's going on in the shadows, but most of the world is just completely oblivious to it. And you can either do something about it or just go on and pretend like nothing's happening. So I kind of like that that story is going alongside with, with the action that's taking place, but... I, I really enjoyed this book. It's another one of those where it's like, it's a fun concept. You know, now hopefully as the story progresses, the spiders just get bigger and bigger and crazier. And then things just go nuts. I had to look it up because I thought I was correct, but I wanted to make sure this is the same artist that did Where Monsters Lie. And that makes sense. It so Very makes sense. Art style. Yeah. Very detailed. Because mm. I was like, this line work, we don't see line work like this yeah. get all the way to final product right. uh, in a lot of comics. And the fact that this is exactly what we're seeing in both of those books, I was like, oh my, I have to check because that yeah. is extraordinary. And so to do two books almost simultaneously that are that detailed, like... And they're both Dark Horse, right? And they're both Dark yeah. Horse. Uh, but, like, that's incredible that you were pumping out this many pages of a story yeah. that looks that good. And, oh my gosh, and this book is... It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I've enjoyed it so far. Yeah. Uh, I think it's been great two issues in. I don't even need a third issue to know that <laughs> That I'm you're fully so... on board. Yes. Uh, speaking of bugs, um, we have Roach Mill number two from It's Alive Comics. And It's Alive is bringing us some old comics that they've kind of like wanted to reboot or restore. And one of the things is, is that Roach Mill was one that they were going to do a reboot for. And the guy that came to them and wanted to do this reboot actually passed away in like November or December of last year. And so they want to keep putting this comic out like even with on like they want to kind of finish what he started in honor of him and so this is roach mill is a previous character but coming into this he is what is called an exterminator and he lives in a world that's kind of full filled with bugs and all kinds of politics around whether or not you can kill giant bugs or giant people or different things like that and roach mill is that that like down home like you know the old bounty hunter who everybody is like oh he's the guy like he's the best of the best uh, but he's the gruff guy that nobody trusts at the same time this whole thing we have learned he has been convicted of a murder and accused of being like somebody who's taken people out and we now know that it is all a setup we know how the setup is happening but Roach Mill has yet to figure that out himself. I mean, he obviously knows he didn't do it, but he doesn't know all the setup as when we come into issue two. And as issue two goes along, he actually does start to piece all of that together and kind of goes on his own investigation to take down the people who are responsible for him uh, doing that. But it's kind of funny because you forget that he's like, he's Roach Mill, 
he is, in fact, a bug in and of himself. And so there's a scene where he's, like, doing push-ups. And he's doing push-ups with his regular, like, arms. But then there's, like, the gross, like, bug ones, like, coming over. Oh, it's, it's a crazy book, but... It's cool to see these old books come back and get a second wind and do that. So thanks, It's Alive, for bringing us books that we haven't maybe have heard of before. I know we talk about great color on books, but I got to say some of the best artwork that I've seen lately has been the black and white books. And there's been some really great black and white comics that have been coming out lately. It's like very reminiscent. Like when I look at this art, it reminds me of like when I first fell in love with like 2000 AD mm -hmm. style art and stuff you'd see in like heavy metal and things like that like more underground comics yeah. and i love that that art style is sort of making its way into i wouldn't say mainstream comics but there's a lot of small press publishers who are like hey maybe that's an art style mm -hmm. that you know we can really we can really put out there so yeah uh, yeah the yeah. art in this book is beautiful keep bringing us these black and white books we're <laughs> loving to see them on the flip side, though, one of the most colorful books on the shelf, um, Kaya, issue eight from Image Comics. Um, are you caught up on Kaya? I don't think I so, right? Not. No. Mm -hmm. um, Kaya is such an awesome story. This is the story of a young girl and her brother, and their world is completely destroyed by the evil people who are trying to take over the world. And Kaya has been taught that she was the, the golden child. She was supposed to have magical powers, and they found out she wasn't. But now that's kind of passed that legacy on to her brother. And so Kaya has taken on the role of protector for her brother. And since everybody else in their tribe has been destroyed, she is trying to get her brother to a safe place where the priest of their people are staying so that maybe they can teach him how to use the magic and save the world. And in our end of our first uh volume we kind of saw them teaming up with some lizard friends and working their way towards it and now we have a problem in that kaya's little brother has been kidnapped and kaya feels like she's failed her mission but she's not willing to let it go until she's given it her all so we are currently on the hunt to try to save her little brother in this beautiful story once again a great all ages book um everybody i know i've got subscribers as young as seven and as old as like 57 who love this book so. It is definitely, and I, I say this about a lot of books, but I think this is one of my favorite books on shelves right now. Uh, Wes Craig is a creator that ever since I read Deadly Class, I was like, okay, whatever this guy's name is attached to. And I remember reading these first few issues. And I was like, oh, this may not necessarily be the type of book, like story that I would be into. And very quickly, I fell in love with the characters and Kaya and I'm ready for, like, Kaya to show her full potential. Oh, yeah. You know, we're building towards that. But I, I love this book. I, I think it's a ton of fun. Um, and it'll be the first one that I catch up on, for sure. And I think that if you were a fan of that first issue of We Live that really focused on the sibling yeah. connection, this is another great one for you. Because for me, you know, the first issue of We Live, I cried because it was about an older sister taking care of her younger brother. And I, like, text my little brother. I was like, I, I don't want to mail you this comic, but, like, because you just need to see this. And I kind of feel the same way with Kaya every time. I'm like, this is how I feel as an older sibling, that I just want to take care of, like, my little siblings. And I'm going to fight giant monsters in the woods to do it um it, it definitely brings that we live and jana books together yeah, almost yeah, in that capacity definitely. um so good um up next we have what's the furthest place from here issue 13 from image comics and the amazing team of tyler boss and matt B. rosenberg um who, who we love um but this is the story of an, a post-apocalyptic world where a bunch of kids have segregated off into different groups. They're their own little gangs, and their gangs are all themed around wherever they chose to hole up in this post-apocalyptic world. And our main group chose a record store, and so their gods have become the record that they selected. And we learn at the very beginning that you never live past 18, that once you like get close to 18, you have to wander off in the woods and just die, essentially. Uh, or at least that's what we've been made to believe, because nobody's ever seen anybody older than that. And in the very first issue, we had a character who went off on their own, and then uh, not long after that, the whole family kind of sorted started looking for them, and people have gotten separated. And this arc of the story has kind of been focused on what happened to all the people that separated from the group. 
what happened to Sydney, who left in the very first issue? What happened to, to Alabama? Um, what happened to all these people? And so we're starting to see it. And so this one is specifically um, the following Alabama and trying not to be broken down by the people who have them uh, in a cage. And we're seeing what that looks like. Like if somebody hold, held you hostage and you were like, I am determined not to break, how long could you really last? And this issue was beautifully done in that sense because you've got like the journal of like day one, I'm I'm never going to bake Brack down. And then you get all the way to like multiple prison escapes and things like that. And it's like, ooh, how long can you actually keep this going? And, and what are we going to see on the other side if you do? So well done. Um, I love this creative team. This is another one like you were just talking about. Like if their names are on it, I'm just going to I'm just going to go and believe that it's going to be great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially top of boss. Yeah. I mean, Matthew Rosenberg, of course, you know, he's one of those big two writers that I'm more intrigued to read whatever big two books he's doing. Um, but both of their indie work has just been phenomenal. Fantastic. And they're such a good team. Yes. Up next, back to the black and white art of greatness. Uh, Blood Moon Comics gives us Titan, Mouse of Might, issue three. Oh, this almost... This probably should have been another one of my picks of the week. <laughs> there was only one book this week that stood above this one, and it was just barely. Um, but this is the story of Titan, who... Uh, you, what you have here is kind of... You have your troubled uh, Batman-esque character here uh, who is breaking into uh, a laboratory to find out some information about what may be going on in terms of testing... Uh, with these with with animals particularly other mice um, but you also kind of have these flashbacks to where titan comes from and also these sort of like ptsd sort of nervous breakdowns that he has where he kind of struggles with his psyche a little bit uh, and in the end of the last issue he runs into um, a bigger kind of an abomination version of him and so this issue is him battling that abomination version and also maybe finding out who this mouse is yeah. and, and what he the past that he's connected to. Um, but then we're also, we finally get to see um, uh, Professor Nimoy, who is the one who um, experimented on Titan and turned him into what he is. So you get a little more of the backstory, you find out. Uh, why Professor Nimoy is doing what he's doing and, and, and a little bit about Titan and maybe where he came from and why he's there. Uh, and, and of course, you know, Titan's like, I'm not going to stand for this. I got to stop you because you're the evil villain. Uh, and, ooh, the cliffhanger at the end of this oh one. Oh, my God. I, I like, like, screamed at the book. I was so excited. I, I, yes. <laughs> it's, it was the perfect cliffhanger you know, for like our three issue rule, it's like the perfect cliffhanger to guarantee that I'm back for issue four. Mm -hmm. uh, the art on this book has been fantastic. I like that each issue you peel back just a little bit of the layer of his origin story without fully, like you drop little bits of information where you're like, oh wait, what? Now there's that added to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've just been enjoying this book and the art is, oh my gosh. I, I love the art on this book. I, I really do. The the details, the line work, the shadowing, top tier. Yeah. I mean, Blood Moon, you've put out some great books, but this is the one that has, has I'm in. Dude, I cannot wait. We keep talking. You know, when Usher of the Dead and all of those came out, we were like, this is going to be a publisher that people need to be watching. And, you know, then Cover the Dead with Lime came, and we were like, Oh my God, people are noticing. And mm -hmm. then everything since then has just been a stellar performance from, from them as a publisher. Mm -hmm. Like their editorial team is really picking some of the best people to work with and books to put out because these books from Blood Moon Comics have just been so good. Yeah. Every next book that comes out, I'm like, oh, is this my favorite Blood Moon book? Like we're at that point now. Is this my favorite Blood Moon book? I don't know. And then the next one comes out. I'm like, is this my favorite? Blood? Like, I'm at the point now where I can no longer choose a favorite. And um, we're going to talk about them probably for years to come because their books are so good. But If I had more money, I would put 
I would buy a cop. I buy all the copies of Titan and I put them in all the Batman subscribers box. <laughs> just be like, this one's on me. Just trust me. If you're looking for an indie kind of version of Batman, that's an anthropomorphic mouse. This is the book. I'm. I'm not gonna lie. I have almost as many Titan subscribers as I do Batman subscribers. Oh. So, <laughs> like, if that if that does help you out in any okay. way, yeah. That makes okay. So, um, up next we have Blood Blood Book. No, <laughs> Blue Book issue four uh, from Dark Horse Comics, and of course James Tynion. Uh, this is this is the story of every alien invasion we've ever heard of, uh, or haven't. Uh, in that capacity this is um it the main story the focal point of every issue is kind of us going through one of the biggest alien possible like kidnappings that has ever happened in american history um a couple that really did exist like you can look all this up this all actually nothing that's happened in this book isn't actually in their full story so each issue kind of goes a little bit further into that story because it was a long drawn out process of them doing interviews with therapists and with the government and different things and so this book kind of gives us the recount of what they think happened and then shows the the moments with the therapists and shows the weird things that happen afterwards uh throughout their story and so it's really cool because you do get to see this and honestly like if you're gonna read it go look up the wikipedia article or at the very least like that's the very least you should go look at the wikipedia article or go find one of the stories on them anywhere on the internet or in a book because it's so cool how much they're keeping from that story almost directly um and then at the back of every book we get a different story that features a, a weird occurrence that could have been an alien thing. And this month's story takes place in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I really, really, really want to go see if any of this stuff like still remains. But it is the story of a woman who may or may not have spontaneously combusted. Uh, she lived in an apartment and she was the the like landlady came over and like knocked on the door and nobody answered and when she went to touch the door it was really really hot so she used her like keys to get into the house or she had the police the police came that's what it was and they broke down the door and when they broke down the door all they found was a leg and a shoe with the shoe and sock and everything still on it and it like the woman had burned in her chair but her leg had no burn marks on it, even though it was disconnected from the body. And the shoe wasn't singed. And, like, none of the newspapers in the house had burned. None of the different things had any ash or fire. Like, there was no stain on the roof from a flame going up. Uh, a, a random neighbor said that they saw a ball of fire that, like, burst through the window and, like, caught, like exploded her. But, like, nobody has been able to figure it out. And there has been years and years of research. And it's like, oh, they kind of initially eventually wrote it off as like oh she was a smoker she must have dropped her cigarette on her and it just burned her her body but it didn't burn anything else in the house and so nothing has been satisfactory and so i kind of want to go uh to st pete's and see if we can find any info of this strange spontaneous combustion story that exists in this comic but if you live here you should totally buy this comic and just learn the story about a weird piece of st pete's history I agree. Yeah. I think you should just pick up this book in general. Because I mean, it's great. You know, it's tiny in. You've got Michael owning art on it, which I always love to see. Uh, the stories in this book reminds me of, I used to have this old, um, I bought it at like half price books for like a buck fifty, and it had nine cassette tapes. And this was back, this was when like way past the time of cassette tapes. <laughs> But it was all old radio programs of, like, people telling these, like, abduction stories on the radio. And it's so bizarre. And so when I read this story, it's very reminiscent of, like, that classic abduction story. Uh, and so I love it. I think it's fantastic. It's crazy because I didn't know that this was a real story. And when issue two came out, one of our customers came in and was like, hey, um, I want to go ahead and subscribe to Blue Book. Because I've always been, like, fascinated by that story of the couple and he named the couple. And I was like, always? Like, what do you mean? He goes, it's a real story. And I was like, James Hyman didn't make this up? And he was like, no. And so he, like, pulled up the articles and started showing them to me. And I was like, no way! 
I had no idea these were real people. I, I thought I'm pretty sure it was in the um, that first yeah. like previews said that it was it's crazy, probably based, based on, on a, a true, true story. story. I think it says I just that, assume yeah. that like it diverges very far mm. from the actual thing, but uh, now that I've read the actual thing, it doesn't diverge at all, and that's crazy. <laughs> so you know, I yeah. learned you learn something. Listen, you know, sometimes your customers bring in some good facts, and it makes stories even better. Um, up next, we have Dead Romans issue three from Image and their Shadowline imprint. Um, this is the story of a bunch of SPQR Roman soldiers during the time of the Roman Empire. And we're kind of following two different groups because we are essentially following a woman who is obviously not a Roman soldier because that was not a thing that they allowed then. But she is with this Roman legionnaire and she is supposed to be helping them get to a point like she's, you know, like a wildling essentially that they have captured um, and they are taking with them. But she is actually the in love with a Roman soldier who is on the other side, like with the other group. And so we kind of see back and forth between the two of them kind of trying to get back to the other person but every time we get a little bit further you get more of that strategy it honestly feels like reading a comic version of somebody playing the game risk at times because it's like oh we have to go over here and then it's like oh we got there and somebody oh the the german army has moved in and they're fighting these people and it's like oh do we take like and then they sit there and they have the conversation of like do we battle them or do we go around or do we hide here and hope for the best and and then you have like the other side who's like ooh if we go through here and so you get all of the war strategy and so if you like things that have a lot of war strategy in them and kind of dealing with that or any of those old um focusing on the Roman Empire is like you like kind of movies or stories like this is gonna be a great one for you because it it is so good and it's it reads so well like you're so captivated by the story as you're going through it and I keep I keep saying it every issue that it really reminds me of the King Arthur movie with Clive Owen and Keira Knightley. Um, but I mean now we're kind of blending in a little more of that like Spartacus, like blending more of the Roman story into it. Like there was a point where she even said, like, Oh, well my family's from Pompeii, but when they moved in and the volcanoes and all this stuff, like and like I was like, Oh man, you always get me when you talk about Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius. Like whatever it is that happens in the rest of this issue, I don't care because you already mentioned Pompeii, so I'm told. Like I that's one of my favorite places in all of Italy. I've never been to Italy at all, but I studied Latin for six years and so I I love love Pompeii when I, and all the stories because most of the Latin textbook takes place around an eruption of Mount Vesuvius and so this is it's so much fun and if you're into things like the the barbarian books of any you know the Conans anything like that honestly you're gonna follow up in line with a lot of this story as well because it does kind of have those those sword and sorcery kind of feels to it and so um, up next, we have Red Zone, issue three from AWA. And what do you got for us? Uh, I like a Cullen Bunn book. I know. You love this book. You talk about it every time. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I am a fan of your sort of old, grizzled, um, awesome, secret, super spy agent type characters. Okay. Uh, and this one is, uh, he's a, a older professor of like Russian literature and culture. Uh, and he is asked to go and retrieve um, someone from Russia. He is asked to go on a mission with um, like a black, so a black ops team uh, to go in. And in that first issue, it turns out to be an old love of his. Um, back from his uh, spy days in Russia. And uh, although she doesn't escape, he does take her daughter with her to uh, get her out of Russia. Things go horribly wrong. And now he is on the run, trying to find a way to get out of Russia. And uh, all he, there's a hit out on him. And so pretty much, very much like John Wick or like the Born Identity. It's like, hey, we put a hit out and now all of... Though the old villains of uh, Professor Kane have or Crane have come out of the woodwork, you have like the old sniper lady who has cataracts. It's funny because it's all old people. Mm -hmm. It's like red. Yeah, it's it's like red, uh, but a little bit more violent. Uh, you have one guy who uh, is also like a giant robot. Um, we're introduced to a few more of those assassins that are kind of chasing him down. 
um, and he is also um, moving across the country trying to find an old friend of his while uh, they look for an escape route. Uh, but it's just it's a great book because I love Professor Crane because right in that first issue you're like oh he's like an just like an old professor mm-hmm. you know and I I would never imagine any of my college professors were once secret agents uh, <laughs> back in the Cold War and whatnot. Um, but this is, it's a really fun book. Mike Diodato's art is, is great. Uh, and I, I'm oddly bummed that there's only one more issue. Uh, possibly of this volume, because it is ah, AWA, and they label their books by volume. That's true. And so. it doesn't feel like three issues in were close to no. an actual uh, uh, wrap-up. I don't even feel like you can wrap up this first volume in the no, next in issue. No, in one issue. So I'm curious, and this is where Cullen Bunn, you know, this is where it, it teeters on, you know, can he wrap this first volume up well enough and also make me want to come back for volume two so we'll see but so far three issues in i'm really enjoying this book yeah yeah i will say i can name at least two of my college professors that if they told me they were secret agents i would believe them at least two Mm-hmm. Or And then, like, one who was never my professor, but the man seems to know enough that he was either an Indiana Jones in a past life or a secret agent. And, like, was just, I 100% believe. Also, I believe that that man is an immortal vampire because I think mm-hmm. he's, like, a million years old and was when he taught us. So I'm like, but, yeah, I'm pretty sure that secret agents hide at my university. And with how small my university was, that would be a great place for former, like, ops to hide. So yeah. I'm going with it. That's but that's why people teach at Howard Payne. <laughs> so. I went to Texas State, so it was, like, a party school and yeah. more laid back. So, yeah, I just didn't feel like any of my teachers would be remotely close. They seemed like the type that was like, I just want to get out of here <laughs> and go back to my house and take on my – my hobbies like plants, and gardening, and real simple people. You know, I don't say simple people, but like, you know, normal, everyday, average. Yeah. You know. I had a professor that looked exactly like Wallace Shawn. <laughs> really? Yeah, and the fact that like he didn't, I'm a hundred percent believe that like every semester at least 20 students probably said inconceivable to him a thousand times. But yeah, the man looked exactly like him, and ironically, was the film professor. Like, the one Mm. that taught, like, film criticism, so he was always watching movies. We'll see. Yeah. I'm just saying. It's it's a conspiracy. Um, Summoner's War Awakening, issue two from Image Comics. And the secret thing that they do not tell you with this is that this is volume two. Uh, This is one of those where we gave the second volume a subtitle, and so we don't have to say it's a second volume. But you will be confused if you didn't read volume one. Phil can attest because I gave him issue one without telling him that it was a second (laughs) volume just to see if it would work. Um, but that said, if you did read volume one, this story is fantastic. Or you can go back and grab volume one and get into a fantastic story. Because this is all about a young girl who has the power of a summoner. She can bring these majestic, magical creatures to help out. And in the very first volume, she is picked up by somebody, like, who's a mage. And he's got this box of magic and they need to protect it and she gets paired with a guy who's like I'm here to be your savior and she's like I don't really need your help and you get the you know immediate conflict between the two of them and uh, in volume one bad things happen and they do not successfully accomplish their mission at all and now in volume two they're like hey here's the new path that we have to take Uh, and she and her her would-be partner have now in this issue teamed up with air pirates And I love air pirates. I don't know what it is, but when you put pirates in flying ships, they automatically become even cooler than pirates already are. And pirates are already super cool. And so this is great because you get the, uh, as they like to say, privateers, not pirates. And uh, I was sold. I am 100% in, in love with the captain of the pirate ship. Um, I don't care. Like, we don't even need to finish the story about the other characters anymore. Like, I'm only here for Captain of the Pirate Ship, whatever. Good guy, bad guy, wherever he ends up being, I'm in. Uh, that's my that's my dude. I'm ready for it. Um, but this is also a mobile game. 
Um, thank you. I was like, that's right, right? I don't know video games. This is a mobile game, so um, if you do play the game, this is connected to that. But if you don't, um, it doesn't matter. And also written by Justin Jordan, who is the writer of The Harrower. Yes. You never would compare the, or connect these two books two in very any different books. capacity, yeah. but it is the same writer, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. and I, I'm a big fan of Justin Jordan, so anytime... I see his name on a book. I'm like, yes, it's good to know that you are still out here putting out comments. And great ones. Yes. Yes. Um, up next, we have Exo Man of War Unconquered, issue three from Valiant Comics. And one of the best teams that they could have assembled to write this story. You've got Becky Cloonan, you've got Michael Conrad, and you've got Liam Sharp on art. Holy cow. Um, I have. It's so great. There's so many things. Like, people come in and they're like, I'm here for the Liam Sharp. And I'm like... Are you? And they're like, maybe I'm here for the Becky Clunan. I don't know. The book's just so good. I didn't even know I liked Exo Man of War. And now I'm like obsessed with them. And I'm like, I know, because you have a great team. And that's magic of comic books. But this is the story of, of Exo Man of War. And it's not a reboot. Um, we are learning that he has woken up in possibly the future and of course Exo Man War has been fighting the Romans his entire life and now he's fighting space Romans um so he is uh I also learned that the Man of War was the suit and not the person mm -hmm. uh when I read issue one of this series and this is a thing that I will give a testament to for Becky and Michael they are so good at catching you up if you don't understand something and they take on a project, like, they connect all the dots. You know, they did it when they took on Wonder Woman. They did it for Batgirls. They're so good at, hey, everything's been all these different places. You don't necessarily know where you are. I'm going to put it really well for you in the very beginning, and now you know. I feel like I'm, like, a master class of Exo Man Award knowledge now, and I've read three issues. But in this particular story, he has the – there is – uh, a desire from these Romans to get his suit because they are building their own army and they have been trying to create the same technology and the same powers that he has and they have continuously failed. And so they need his suit really just so that they can figure out where they're going wrong so they can build an entire army of these people. And in this issue, he's kind of been... Uh, partnering with their seer, their oracle, and his suit... I, AI is like, this is a terrible idea. Like, I know you see a pretty face and you think, I'm going to be the, her hero. But that's stupid. And think with uh, your brain and not the rest of you. And he's not listening. And so we know that this is going to end badly for him in some capacity. And I cannot wait to see how it blows up in his face. But there it is. I'm happy to see a Valiant book that could gain new followers of Valiant because I feel like Valiant has always had the same fans but it's never really grown its fan base yes. um, and it's a bummer because I feel like they do have some really cool properties like Exo Man of War I even like some of the early like Archer and Armstrong stuff that I was coming out I like the out. new Shadow Man stuff that Colin Bunn Shadow was doing Man. actually um, and it, like I thought I think Bloodshot's kind of a cool character uh, so there's some things that I like I really hope this is Valiant taking their titles in new directions and hoping that a new fan base comes out of that. Yeah. Uh, this is a great start. Yeah. Like you said, this is a creative team that could get anyone to, to come in and be like, all right, I, I guess I should probably check this out. And if you are a current Valiant fan, you won't lose it. I have people who are already like, I subscribe to all things Valiant. Doesn't matter what it is. I've been a Valiant subscriber since I was a child, and they are still picking this up, and they are still loving it. So it's whether yeah. you're new or old, like, to the Valiant world, you're not going to be disappointed because both sides of that coin are actually really loving this. Nice. Yeah. Up next, we have Darkwing Duck, issue five, from Dynamite Comics. And I'm going to let you do this because I know you're so stoked <laughs> about Darkwing Duck. <laughs> I, it's... It, you know, I am happy that Disney is allowing a lot of properties to come out in comics. Um, I like that they're doing the Saturday morning stuff. I like that they're doing the villains. Uh, I, I just, more Disney in comics. I, I'm perfectly okay with that. You know, bring Uncle Scrooge back. You know, that's that's really all I, re I want at some point. Uh, but Darkwing Duck, you know... The, the one of my favorite Disney characters. Uh, every issue has been fantastic because we are basically getting all of the best villains 
uh, in the Darkwing Duck universe, all the wonderful side characters. And in this issue, he is uh, at a spa day. He's having a spa day with Launchpad. <laughs> and they find out that it is actually uh, Liquidators, uh, another great Darkwing Duck villain coming in. Uh, it's Liquidators um, uh, Spa, and he is teaming up with somebody else who's behind the scenes, um, creating this like organic brand and attaching it to everything, uh, and trying to take over the world, of course, with something like Mind Control. And what's really wonderful is you find out that Liquidator is working for Dr. No Good. Just, it's, <sighs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you to Disney and Dynamite for putting this comic out because every issue, and like even this one's going to be a two-parter probably. Mm -hmm. They're going to do an, a follow-up with, with Dr. No Good, but it just, like when they put Bushroot in there, I was like, okay, you're already bringing out some of my favorite bigger guns in the Darkwing Duck universe, and it just keeps going. It just keeps getting better, and do this forever. Yeah. Just put this book out forever. Uh, I feel honestly like I'm back watching the show again. Um, it's it's been a ton of fun. A hundred percent. If you're a fan of the show and you're not grabbing this comic, you're doing yourself a disservice because it's just it's like when they continued Buffy in comics, yeah. but they are continuing Darkwing Duck. Mm -hmm. And you brought up the Disney villains. I don't know if you heard this announcement, but the next Disney villain that got announced for the comic is Hades. Wow. So that's your exciting news for the day is Hades is the next uh, Disney villain getting his own title from Dynamite. And I'm so stoked that one is going to, it's going to be. From Hercules? Oh, mm -hmm. It's going to be a fan favorite. I'm going to run out of that no matter what I order on the first day. <laughs> I'm so stoked. I don't talk about Hercules a lot, but I remember loving that movie so much that we went out and got all the collector's plates uh -huh. from Burger King. And it was like every one we would drive to like multiple Burger Kings in a day and be like, oh, was it McDonald's? It was McDonald's. That had and the they had the toys that had the the cases. That you I remember those. I thought I thought McDonald's, McDonald's had. Burger this. King didn't have that kind of money. Oh. <laughs> and Disney has always had a partnership with McDonald's, hasn't they? Oh, really? haven't they? No, that, that wasn't surprising. You're kind of right because Hunchback of Notre Dame was Burger King, King. right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it was. Look it up, I'll Toy look Man. It up. Because I remember we went hunting for those plates like crazy. We had to have all of them. I do know we do not talk about Burger King's toy game near enough in this world. Everybody talks about McDonald's toys, but Burger King has always had excellent toys as well, and we do not talk about it. The clown. It's McDonald's. Yeah. McDonald's. Yeah, because the display was Ronald McDonald, like, hugging the display every time. Mm -hmm. You know... I, I talk about Hercules a lot because, like I just said, I took wow, Latin for yeah. six years and I was very bitter when they tried to force us to watch that in Latin class and it was wrong. <laughs> but I love that movie. It is the biggest war that I've ever had in my, in like my internal soul is that like the like nerdy like Latin kid in me hates it because it's not right to Latin or Greek, like Roman or Greek mythology. But it, movie. but the other side of me is like, it is also one of my favorite Disney movies it's of all time. Such a, it's... And so I battle. It's up, it's, it's up there in, like, top three for me, I, probably. I would I would probably put it... It's definitely in my top five. Megara is definitely, like, my Disney princess of choice, too. She's so fantastic. She's um, awesome. I love her so much. And the songs on Hercules are fire. Yes, sir. Six plates, 80 bucks on eBay. Oh, my gosh. Don't tell him these things. I mean, I... Four for 50 bucks. That's an expensive plates. <laughs> I mean, mine are all in a landfill somewhere. But. And Hercules is still probably the like, like you said, like it's a fan favorite. It's a top three to five for a lot of people. I don't know about so, a lot of people. A lot of people, I do, because I'm a cosplayer, and I know how many people have made Hades costumes because they love James Woods Hades so much. Wow, it is a, like as a person who grew up a Disney like a Disney adult and was around Disney adults my whole adulthood. They will all tell you, like, it's, like, my favorite. Like, they'll say, like, oh, I love this movie. Oh, and Hercules, obviously. It's, like, it's like they don't even think about it. It's, like, oh, See, yeah, I, Hercules. I feel like most people are probably, like, Aladdin, Lion King, Beauty and the Beast. Like, those are top threes for probably most people, I would assume. I would say, in the way that we say Spider-Man is everybody's second favorite superhero, Hercules Who? is probably everybody's Spider-Man. It's a Star Kid quote. Oh. Spider-Man is everybody's second favorite superhero. Hercules. Comment. 
favorite Disney movies. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Comment your favorite Disney movies. Uh, I Like the animated classics, not like, you know, Apple Dumpling Gang or something like that. Like, just actual animated classics. I mean, off the top, probably Robin Hood. Same. Oh, 100%. I think Robin Hood was the best of all of them. Hands down. The movie was so much fun to watch. It was so much fun. I honestly and truly think we only have furries today because of that movie. <laughs> because I think, like, everybody wanted to be Robin Hood after watching that movie. He was but, so like, cool. as a fox. He like, was so slick. Yeah, dude, that was the hottest fox ever. And she was hot, too. They I, all were. I need to rewatch that one. It's been a long time since I've seen that one. When I, when I got COVID the very first time, Matt came in and turned on Robin Hood for me, and then I didn't see Matt for, like, three days because of having COVID and like Matt was like I just knew you would want to see Robin Hood when you were sad and I was like it's totally true that is exactly what I want to see when I'm sad I have the that's like one of the the, it is the very first pop I think I ever got is my friend Ashley bought me the pop of Robin Hood when it came out and I was like I like wasn't even like into pops and I think I cried at the restaurant like when she gave it to me I was like oh my god like it's Robin Hood did did McDonald's ever do toys for those I mean, for the Robin Hood line? Robin Hood was 1973. Yeah, I was oh, yeah, like, that, that was, was so long, far before, like, any yeah, of the Yeah, I forgot toy- that was one of the earlier ones. Right. We didn't have our ob- obsessive toy generation yet. So, yeah. Ooh, Ram said Sword in the Stone and the Black Cauldron. Oh, um, I forget about Sword in the Stone. Oh, man, I don't. It Ma- goes under the radar for me. I just said last week that Madame Mim is actually the Disney villain. I want to get a, a Dynamite comic line. That'd be cool. Um, I think she's she's so funny because she has all the power in the world, but she's also, like, a crazy old lady. Like, she's essentially a crazy cat lady, but, like, with all the power in the world and forgets that she has it and uses it all kinds of wrong. But, yes, please, again, drop your favorite Disney animated classics in the comments because we want to know. Um, and while you're doing that, we're going to talk about The Ambassadors, issue five uh, from Image Comics. It is. They are cranking these out because we are getting really close to big games, so they are having to get that. And they finally released, um, I talked about this last week, they finally released the, like, map of everything that's going to be in big game, and it is everything. What's big game? That is Mark Millar and Pepe Larraz's big crossover this summer, and it is everything that has ever been a part of the Mark Millar universe everything somehow like jupiter's legacy and kingsman and kick-ass and all all of it yeah it is not going it is going to be a massive massive explosion of characters and i have no idea how it's going to work but it is all going to work like there were titles in there that i totally forgot that mark muller had um but ambassadors has actually been possibly my favorite thing that he has ever done um, this is the story of a woman who figures out how to generate superpowers, and she kind of has them in, like, the, the matrix, essentially, where you can, like, tap into it and say, I want to know how to fly, and suddenly you have the power of flight. But you can only one person can use it as a time at a time within her world. But she decides that she's going to change the world by giving people from each country, essentially, superpowers. And she's only going to pick one person to represent each country, and they have to actually be a good person. And so, so far, all of the stories have that we have seen have actually made me cry. The last two issues, I, like, bawled like a baby when we determined what was the behind the reasoning and everything for picking the people. I was like, oh, my God, these are too much for me. Um, but this issue is the first time that we actually don't have a good person get the powers. And... The reason why, like, she even has the conversation with this person when he comes to her and is like, I want to have superpowers. And she's like, you're not, you don't fit the bill. You're, you're not the kind of person I would pick. And he gives her the reason for all of the bad choices he made in his life and the reason for all the things that he did that were wrong and why he thinks he deserves redemption, essentially. And it's such an interesting concept because every story has been, oh, obviously this person is the hero. And then this one was so the opposite of that that it gave us such a good good change to what we've seen. Because he has given us kind of the same thing in every issue. And so getting that was so great. But we're also seeing the rise of the villains at the same time coming from the ex-husband of the woman who's been giving out these superpowers. And so... 
this only has one more issue, so I don't know if that's going to even come to fruition now or if that's going to come to fruition in big game. But Ambassadors, whether you're a fan of Mark Millar, whether you care about big game, whether you even know what that is, read Ambassadors. This is, honestly, this is a really, really great story. And I hope we get enough of an ending for people who don't care to go to big game yeah. to still love this series because it has been a great standalone to this universe. And it might actually, does it have it? No. Yeah, I was it doesn't have the thing. It, it was in the back of whatever came out last week. No, it doesn't have it this week. So it's a massive, massive, massive crossover. If he's ever put his name on a book, it's in there. Like even Nightclub, which we're going to talk in a minute, might have it in there. But that's going to be a part of it. So are you looking up this book? <laughs> yeah. There's a website, and now I like the art. So. I was going to say, I just saw that too, and I'm like, that looks great, whatever that is. Here. And maybe his daughter? It could be. It's emilybrooksmillar.com, and we're looking up this new book that's at the back. Ooh, she's got a portfolio and oh, everything. All like right, we like might one. we might have a, a new book that we have to hunt down. Up next, we have Nervous Rex, issue two from It's Alive. And we talked about this earlier. It's Alive is bringing us reprints of classic stories. These are... Almost all the comic strips. I don't know if, if Nervous Rex was a strip or if it was actually issues in the past, but it has that classic strip feel to the way the storytelling is. But it is the story of a Tyrannosaurus Rex who is teeny tiny and doesn't have any of the kingly abilities of a, of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. He's very nervous. But he's married to this giant dinosaur who is that, like, cranky old like wife that nags him and tells him he's you're supposed to be the king why aren't you bringing home kingly things for me and so every issue has essentially been the story so far of of their relationship and uh you get a couple of stories in each one because it is like i said a little more like blown up strips um but at the end of the last issue we thought we were going to get a story about him and his fear of oatmeal and at the beginning of this one, he even says, like, wait, we're not supposed to tell this story. I'm supposed to tell the story of my fear of oatmeal. And she's like, well, we're not doing that because I don't want to do that. So now I don't know if we're ever going to get that story. But in this one, the first one is all about how his wife wants to take a nap. And your classic comic strip hijinks ensue where every, she's like, if anything wakes me up, I'm going to, I'm going to lose it on you. And he's doing everything he can to keep her quiet and literally like the, the asteroid that destroys the dinosaurs kind of thing crashes down and she doesn't wake up for any of it. And then he finally like stops the last thing and he sighs and she wakes up for the sigh. And she's like, oh, you couldn't let me sleep for five minutes. And he's like, uh, uh. And so it's just, it's classic comic strip hijinks. And then you get a couple of other things like along the way. You get another story or two in the back. And so if you haven't read It's Alive Ever Before, um, or uh, they're giving you these kind of reprints, but Nervous Rex is all about that dinosaur. It's not a kid's book. I have so many people who are like, oh, it's a cute little dinosaur. Is it for kids? No, this is not a kid's book. There's foul language. The second story in here is about like how she wants to meet with him. And he's like, I don't want to do it. She scares me kind of thing. So um, it's not a kid's book, but it's great for adults who love classic comics and classic comic strips. So um, up next, we have Harrower, issue four from Boom Studios. Uh, possibly the end. Possibly the end. I didn't put it in the endings because it, I, it's, so does it say it's the end? It doesn't. It does it doesn't say it's the end, but it definitely... It definitely feels like the end, but I was like, I'm kind of like, you know, no. the panel at the end, it could it could be the end, it could not be the end, so I didn't I didn't actually put it there. It felt but like an ending. It did feel like an ending. But this is very much like your horror slasher, sort of the urban legend villain uh, who kills high school teens, because mm -hmm. that is typically what happens... And so we have the group of high schoolers who are on their way to a party. And, of course, the harrower is there. And that second issue, he pretty much massacres all the kids. Like, this entire party is just destroyed. Uh, and then, then the third issue, uh, the, the remaining few uh, are trying to escape. And they kind of reach the end of the maze uh, at the 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 end of that last issue, and this one gives us the origin story 
of uh, of the character and kind of what is is going on with this urban legend and the town and kind of all the messed up stuff that's been going on. Uh, I thought it was a great. If it is the final issue, I felt like it wrapped it up well mm-hmm. enough to where I was like, okay, this is this is really cool. I like how they did this. Um, but it's also possible that if they do decide to continue on with this book, they left it just enough to where it's like, ooh, okay, I, I want to see where this now goes. Right. You could definitely do this like any other slasher thing where it's like harrower to the harrower returns kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, harrower know. in space. Right. Harrower Harrower takes Manhattan. I was going to (laughs) say. You could totally do that and it would be wonderful and I would be here. And then five uh, volumes from now, you have to just call it Harrower again, so we're all confused. Mm -hmm. And it's a soft reboot. Yeah. Yeah. We're in. And we'll and we'll buy it. So just it's a requel. It's a requel. Yes. It it in five volumes from now. So we'll see you then. Justin and Boom Studios. Drive this franchise into the ground like you do every other horror franchise out there. Because we're here for it. <laughs> yes. Keep going. <laughs> Up next, we have Griffin, Galaxy's Most Wanted, Issue 2 from What Not Publishing. This is the story of a woman who is the, like, old, like, was a bad person she was in the mil. they were in the military sorry they were in the military and they did all of the things wrong they were constantly like they were the one who just went in and like massacred everybody and they kind of get to the point where they're not okay with that anymore and they were in prison with a, a woman who is trying to just save her people because she's but she's a revolutionist and so they imprisoned her and they both broke out together in in issue one and they have been battling against the galaxy's like supreme command since then. And one of the things that they have been doing is they've got the team back together and they have in this issue, they are working to save um, a, a planet that has been overrun by the get the empire. And they're trying to give them food and trying to give them the ability to grow their own food and kind of leave their empire resistant, like their, their dependency on the empire that's using them so poorly. Um, it's, it's so great because we get a lot of stories where we have a dude, like a man who is kind of a crass soldier. Like you were talking about earlier, like where he's always the one that like makes the off, off-color joke he's always the one that is ultra violent but we don't see that for women a lot so kind of like space lady where it was like wow we gave a female character the chance to have all of that that we don't get to see we've done that again with griffin in this story and i love that because it is it's you know we're seeing this character growth and there's a, a character in here who's young who's like oh i'm just so happy that we're the heroes and we're making the difference and griffin's like you have to understand that you cannot use the H word. Like, we're not heroes. We're not necessarily good people. We are helping somebody, but we're not doing, and we're we're doing it maybe for good reasons, but really our ultimate reason is that we hate the Empire. And we're going to kill those people if we have to, and we're gonna, like, we're gonna do bad things to bring them down. So, like, let's, like, lay off on the H word. And I love that we have that conversation as well, because as we're going to see this character growth for Griffin, we're going to see that she they might learn that they are, in fact, a hero. But they're so against the word right now, and they're so worried about not being a hero that um, we're, we're kind of seeing a really great groundwork for a character. And this is always oversized. for This is, like, probably the, the deepest of the whatnot titles. A lot of them are very light on story and just have, like, cool splashy art pages. This one has a lot of stories you in. takes um, a little bit of time to get through each issue, and I kind of love that for them. Yeah. And so, um, up next, we've got Stray Sheep Issue 4 from Blood Moon Comics. Um, this is the story of a man named Coulson who... In issue one, I once again will say, trigger warning if you read issue one, loses everything. Uh, The world goes very, very dark for Coulson very, very quickly. And in issue two, he's essentially given the opportunity to join a secret society. And the secret society involves basically playing a game, a set of games that is, is kind of in that, like, 
you know, saw red room kind of situation where it's like, you know, you're going into this room and you may not make it out alive. Um, you're, you're playing a game with somebody whose intention is to kill you and you're lucky if you don't die. And Colson's like, what do I have to lose? I, I'm in. Uh, whatever. If I die, that's what I was going for anyway. And at this point, Colson has been playing these games and he's actually made an ally, which is against the rules. And we have finally gotten to the point issue four where the people in charge have figured out that there is some fraternizing going on and maybe some cheating. And Colson and his his teammate are at, in very much in danger as they're starting to figure out that that might in fact be the case. Uh, but we still know nothing about this secret society, which um, the fact that no little, like there's not been any trip ups, there's not been anything for us to figure out about them. And he's not investigating. This is another thing I love about this story is he just keeps showing up to these destinations, like every issue and playing these games, but he's not really investigating what is going on and who these people are. And usually when we have stories like this, they're like, oh, I have to bring them down or I have to figure out what's going on. Colson's not looking into any of this. And yet he has made this ally and they are kind of trying to see themselves through. But it's like, what are you seeing yourself through? You don't even know if there's an ending to this or if this is the rest of your life. And and so I love that we don't know where this is going at all. And every page has either him in one of these games or these people kind of following him. So every page is like heightened level of suspense with this story. Every single like panel, I'm like, oh my God, is this the one? Like, does this in here? Like, does this, is is he going to make the wrong choice? Because he's got to, he's got to play these games. And if he makes the wrong choice in the game, they kill him. And it's like, is he going to, is he going to die? Is any is somebody I know going to die? Because we start to meet other people, and you're like, oh, my God, is this person going to make it out alive? Like, obviously, people die in every page and every panel of this book. And, and so it's such an intense book. They do such a good job between the artwork and the storytelling of actually building intensity, which I think is a hard thing to do in, in storytelling in general to make violence believable enough to be intense but also to make suspense believable enough. And they are merging that so perfectly in this story to where every time I'm like, oh my God, all right, I have to like build myself up to go into the issue. And then when I get in the issue, I'm like, are we going to make it? And I know how many issues this is. And so I'm like, but I'm still worried that Colson's not going to make it out every time, which shows how phenomenal the writing and the art both have worked together to do that because I'm, I am a nervous wreck every time because it's so good. So kudos to the creative team on this for such a good book. Up next, we have Nightclub Issue 5 from Image Comics, also a part of this Mark Millar universe we are building up. And if you haven't started Nightclub yet, one of the coolest things is that it is only $1.99. It's great books to get into right now. We did just get more copies of Issue 1 in so if you are looking to read it, there are new copies of issue one on the shelf. Um, but this is a story of a bunch of kids who really want to be famous by doing stupid things on the internet. And one of the kids gets hurt, gets picked up by a police officer who turns him into a vampire. And of course, if you're a teenage kid who wants to be famous on the internet, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to go home and tell your friends and then turn them into vampires. And they realize, hey, we could be superheroes because we have vampire powers now. And so in the last couple of issues, they've been acting as superheroes and kind of drawing way too much attention to themselves. And now the police officer has brought them all together to tell them they are acting a fool and they need to stop because there are actually evil vampires out there that we've never heard of in the last five issues who may or may not be coming for them and if they come for them there is all kinds of bad stuff that is going to happen and guess what uh spoiler alert because it happens on like page two they do come and now the kids are being threatened that they have to either join these evil vampires or their families will die and this is going to set us up for whatever happens next and somehow this also leads into big game and i have no idea what this event is going to be this is the most 
weird off the wall crossover that has ever happened and I like you're you are definitely selling it on just the fact that none of these things make sense together and they're yeah. all going to come together somehow so um but standalone connect like unconnectedness nightclub definitely a fun book and only a dollar 99 per issue so it's a great way to jump into um a different take on vampires in our modern society I'm not even a big Mark Millar fan but I've been enjoying all these all the new books. I'm a, I think I'm behind on Ambassadors and one other one. Um, Nemesis Reloaded? No. That's You're not the, behind on that's that. That's the one I... Yeah. I <laughs> that's like, the one I've been enjoying the most. Yeah. Yeah. Um, up next, we have The Forge, issue three from Image Comics. And Prestige Format. And Prestige Format, Phil's favorite. who doesn't love a good Prestige Format. All that artwork blown up into bigger, beautiful pages. And this is the book to do it on. Mm -hmm. uh, I gotta say, sometimes I get very nervous when I pick up a sci-fi book, and I'm like, "Oh, how like how heady is this gonna be? Like, how much are you gonna open up this universe? How like you?" So I get, I, I'll say, and I think that a lot of this is with like old English books. I get very nervous when there's words that I either can't pronounce or I don't know the meanings to a lot of the words. Um, the great thing about this is, and I can go back and show it real quick, is at the beginning of each issue, uh, Rucka does sum up everything that's going on. He reminds you of each of these characters and who they are. Uh, and essentially, this is a, a universe where um, everyone that we have seen so far is a clone of the Empress. Uh, you have the forged characters who are, um, let's get that one, although I would love to show that two-page spread. Um, uh, the forged are like the warriors, and then you have the Cassandras, who are like the precogs, um, who kind of you know tell where to go with these missions. They're kind of like the ambassadors who go out into space. And in the first issue, they get a distress beacon from a planet, and they go to check it out, thinking that maybe it could just be like that maybe they need to go pick up some equipment or weaponry or anything but they end up finding a cassandra who um is has been hiding out and waiting for them to show up and they've been battling the worms on this planet like oh this is the villain that we've been trying to face and destroy and this is what the war has been about but it actually turns out we find out that there is a whole other villain a bigger, badder one who is coming to wreak havoc and pretty much destroy the universe, as all villains are out to do. Uh, and we are actually introduced to this villain. Uh, it's real creepy too. Mm -hmm. Like it's like it. It looks like a bunch of giant worms, but then there's also like let me actually go to it. Um, but there's like all these bodies attached to it as well that like talk for it. Um, God, where is that? Yeah. This is where you see it. It's like a bunch of eyes and tentacles, and it uses like um, dead bodies to talk, and it's like in broken English. And it's basically like, oh, we as all the other organisms of the universe have stood by while humanity has just like experimented on us and destroyed us. And we are now out to destroy you. And the Forge team is like, uh, no, that's not going to happen because we're awesome women warriors and we're not going to let that, we're not going to stand for that. And also the Cassandra has like this cool armor. This, look, this book is super awesome. Uh, I feel like with the addition of it being a prestige format, it should be a pick of the week for me every time it comes out because uh, I love it. And the artwork is fantastic. Like anytime the Cassandra is is on the page and like they'll like go into the mind and like show how they view the, the universe and it's just so beautiful this is such a great story to put in prestige format it's greg rucka so i have faith that the story is going to go in a place that i enjoy and also wrap up really well mm -hmm. um but i i have been loving this book uh it's i think it's a sci-fi book that anyone can get into mm -hmm. and not feel overwhelmed because they're not really building the world outwards. No, not at all. It's very much like a linear story of this team going through this this journey and sort of seeing who the villain is and 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 bringing it all out. Um, so I do enjoy it because it feels it feels very much like a video game where it's like you're going through a story and levels 
and you can kind of explore a little bit, but it's not open world. If you can enjoy aliens, yeah, like aliens, not alien, aliens, mm-hmm. then you can enjoy uh, this because it does lean more on that action and the storytelling mm-hmm. and the suspense that Alien did. So if you are, are good with that sequel, like, and you were like, man, what if the whole team was Sigourney Weaver? Yeah. Then, then this yeah. is what you get. This is like a yeah. team of Sigourney in, yeah. Weaver kicking butt the whole time. In mech suits. Yeah. That, yeah, like when she's got the yeah. suit on. Like this yeah. is like you put Sigourney Weaver in the suit, like, and you made five of them. Mm-hmm. And then gave her a precog woman, like an oracle to to protect, who calls out the shots of like where somebody's going to be in the yeah. next like 37 seconds mm-hmm. at all times. It's, it's, it's what you need. This is Predator with female characters entirely like yeah 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 Yeah. i've i've had a ton of fun with it i get excited every time i see that that big prestige format in the pile and i've i've loved it every second of the way so far yes we've got some books ending for sure looks like new for sure we're ending this week uh first up bulls of beacon hill issue five from aftershock and this is the story of a guy who is about to run for office. He's very excited about it. He has, like, this perfect life. Like, him and his partner are going to announce that he's going to go for, like, mayor, I think it is. And they're, like, doctors. They've lived everything perfectly. His ex-girlfriend slash best friend from, like, from college is, is his campaign manager. It seems like everything's perfect, except we learned in issue one that his dad is the biggest mob boss of this town. And his dad is not happy that, A, he's running for mayor, B, he has not established that he is the son of this monster. And and see that he's he's a queer man. And that he's going to expose all of that and all of the family secrets by running for office. And so the dad actually sends somebody after him. And is like, We're, I'm putting a hit on you. Like, all of my guys are coming for you. And this guy's like, I have to take down my dad. Like, I have to face my demons in order to move forward in life physically. And, and so it kind of puts, like, this big strain on all of his relationships because nobody really knows that that's who he really is. And so this is him having to not only come to terms with who he really is and fight the past uh, emotionally, but him literally having to make that decision and go after his dad physically. And uh, it's been such a great story. Steve Orlando has a really great way of, of taking the tropes and the classic stories and using them as a way to, to also push... Um, this message to us of of like acceptance in all capacities. You know, he did it with superheroes. He's done this. He did it um, with pretty much everything that he's ever touched. And I love that. I love that he finds a way to push a message of acceptance of ourselves and the world around us in everything he does. Um, it's so good. And if you haven't read it, it's a great classic, like, go and take down the mob story. But again, with this heartfelt message at the back of it. Is it just me or is has Aftershock not been putting out as much? They have not put out as much because of the the uh, bankruptcy. Oh, so that's right. They're putting out a bunch of that the the sense. books that they are trying to complete the stories of, mm. um, and then they're kind of taking a little bit of a break to rebuild and restructure um, and kind of figure it out. They are still listed in the previous catalog, but like the next previous catalog kind of just has their backlog. Um, they don't have any new titles that are on the slate right now, like coming up in like July and things like that. So we're gonna see the end of a lot of the titles we have, and then um, it, we're gonna we're gonna see a little bit of a pause while they they do finalize everything that they're okay. researching. So um, up next we have Plan Fifty Nine from Outer Space Issue Three from uh, Dren Publications and uh, Dren Productions. I would say Publications because I think books, but it's Dren Productions. Um, I guess this is actually probably the newest publisher that we've been talking about. But Plan 59 from Outer Space is is your classic pulp sci-fi story uh, in the modern world. There is a group of aliens who is trying to take over the world. And they realize that we are obsessed with our cell phones. And so this alien thinks the brightest idea that they could come up with, the fastest way to take over all of Earth, is to basically put mind control into the cell phones because everybody is going to be on their cell phones. And literally within like three hours, they have control of the entire planet. Except for one woman who is our main character and who has who accidentally broke her cell phone 
in the very first issue um, from just happenstance. And so she didn't get the, the mind control. And now she is the one woman who can stand against the aliens and battle for the sanity of Earth. But guess what? She doesn't necessarily win. And there is one thing that could overpower the aliens and that is something I'm not going to spoil for you. So uh, you should definitely read this book and then you should definitely be wary of um, all things related to technology. Um, but this was so much fun because it is pulpy but it is modern. So it feels like almost reading like a War of the Worlds kind of like, oh and the aliens came like the radio show. Like not like the actual novel but like listening to the radio show. Like the aliens came Game and they did this and then uh and but you're in in modern times and they're messing with your cell phones so i highly recommend if you love pulp sci-fi that you check this out um up next we have the conclusion of radiant pink which is issue five of five from image comics and this is a part of your massive verse but as we always say if you don't read everything in the massive verse, which is the Radiant Black universe, it doesn't matter. This actually has very little to do with Radiant Black. Um, there is a reference to Marshall. They do make a phone call to Marshall, who is one of the Radiant's Black, but there is uh, not actually any Radiant Black in the story. So this is the story of Radiant Pink, who is a a video game blogger. She has a Twitch stream, essentially, and she's trying to hide that she is Radiant Pink while she's still playing her games. And in the beginning, the very first issue, she ends up going to save somebody from a hospital and ends up teleporting to another planet. She can't get out of it. The person goes with her. She ends up falling in love with the person. They have this great adventure. They go to a wonderful planet full of cats. It's amazing. They want to get out of there. I don't know why, personally, if I got teleported to a planet full of cats, I'd be quite content for the rest of my life. Um, but when they get back, things seem to be um, very hostile between the the three people, the three girls, can't seem to, to learn how to challenge, uh, face the challenges of the girlfriend, best friend, uh, you know, dynamic, as we see in all superhero stories. And... Um, as we go into this last issue, we're kind of learning that there may be something wrong with the technology that has been powering Radiant Pink's girlfriend, and it has led her to um, an explosive personality, to say the least. And Radiant Pink has to kind of figure out who she wants to be and what's the most important thing to her in in this world. And one of the things I love about the Massive Verse is the thing that matters most to the characters is the humanity within them every time and that human element is what makes these stories so strong and this one is definitely a really great conversation um in the end about mental health and the persona that we put of ourselves online versus uh, the mental health that we need to give ourselves in in real life outside of that and learning when it is okay to take a break and when it's okay to uh, be there for yourself versus having to be there for everybody at all times. And I thought this had such a beautiful ending uh, and all the things they had to say about it. I was like, oh man, everybody needs to hear this message. Like I kind of just want to take this last couple of panels and just put them up on the internet and be like, hey, I don't know who needs to hear this, but if you're on the internet today, it's probably you because it was so good. So read Radiant Pink. It's five issues and it's so much fun. Um, next up, we have Dead Seas Issue 6 from IDW and their originals in print. This is the story of a ship full of ghosts. And not in the traditional sense where it's like, oh, this ship just came out of the water from 200 years ago. This is a ship that prisoners are sent to to work on where they are storing ghosts because they have realized in this world that ectoplasm is the number one energy source and of course what do we do in america when we find a new energy source we definitely abuse it completely and totally and so this uh ultra capitalist man has figured out that ectoplasm is strong and so he has trapped all of these ghosts on the ship and is harvesting their ectoplasm and his daughter has come to the ship to figure out what kind of conspiracies are going on in there. And boy, does she find something she was not expecting. And I'm not going to tell you 
anything about what that is because everything that happens in this issue is a spoiler uh, to the entire story. Issue 5 kind of gave us our cliffhanger of what that was going to be. And oh my God, it's it so good. And we've been kind of following the daughter and this prisoner that came there that was just trying to get his life back on track so he could get back to his daughter as soon as possible. And the way these two stories intersect in this issue and the way that we wrap up both stories for the ending. Um, bravo. Such a great job. I wanted to cry um, just from some of the beautiful moments that both of those characters got at the end of the story. And if you have not picked it up yet, it's complete. If you like single issues, you can grab all of the single issues and it's time to binge. Um, or you can wait for a trade at this point. But I definitely think you should read Dead Seas. And honestly, you should read everything that's coming out from the IDW Originals imprint because they have they have not done me wrong yet. All of them are amazing. I just ordered the Crashing trade paperback today. If you did not read Crashing from uh, IDW's original imprint, I think that was like my pick of the year last year or at least in my top like three. Uh, if you go back and watch our top 22 of 22, uh, it was such a beautiful book. So um, seriously, grab your IDW original's imprints. Um, all right, we've got some things that are starting this week or, or one shots as some of them may be. And I think the first two are one shots. Um, the first one is Mullet Cup, License to Krill. I'm so excited, Mullet Cup. And this is from Scout Comics. Uh, yes, and it's uh, the opposite of prestige format. It's in this nice uh, 5 by 5 shrimp-sized format is what Scout is calling it. That makes sense. Yeah. Shrimp size. Because he's licensed to krill. Yes. Uh, so uh, if you're not familiar with Mullet Cop, he is essentially, uh, it's basically like Paul Blart mm -hmm. uh, mixed in with like an Adult Swim show. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's wonderful. I would love to see a live action with Danny McBride yes. uh, playing Mullet Cop. And in this one... And it is licensed by... Uh, it was uh, optioned by Hulu. I did not know that. Yeah, after the first issue came out. That is good to know. I would love to see this. And they're all uh, unconnected, just because I did just say first issue. It's yeah, all anthology. Yeah, like one-shot, you know, one-off missions. In this one, he is battling a seafood restaurant owner and, uh, and scientist, Bob Duncan, who... In a horrible lab accident uh, while trying to compare, like, mesh his DNA uh, with shrimp, he turns himself into a giant shrimp. And uh, Mullet Cop is uh, sent to a mall food court to prevent uh, the destruction of this mall food court <laughs> from a giant shrimp. And uh, it is, it's everything you would want. And a mullet cop. I was bummed that it was so small and short, um, but it still had everything that I needed. Everything. And a mullet cop's issue. I don't know why I never thought of Danny McBride playing him. Danny McBride, you are the only option. Hulu, I don't know what you're thinking with your show, but Danny McBride is the only option. Yeah. Oh my God. It would, it would be great to see him. Or, honestly, I, I know this would never work, but if Michael Sarah could get fat... And grow hair. And grow a mullet, uh -huh. I would want to see a fat Michael Sarah play this character. I mean, I could see that. You know? But, yeah, I think Danny McBride is... Danny is, McBride's is got it option. unlocked. Like, yeah, pick this up. You know, it's fun, little-sized, uh, but you still get that full story. Yeah. Um, up next, speaking of one-shots, we have the 2023 one-shot for Supermassive. From Image Comics and your massive first imprint, essentially. Let's just call it what it is as an imprint at this point. Yeah. Um, this is the annual crossover of all massive verse titles. And this is the first time we see the Dead Lucky universe cross into the massive verse. So uh, really excited to see that. But this is um, our Radiance Black rogue son and our dead lucky characters uh coming together to uh go through some trials nick if you didn't read it yet please cover your ears. sorry i should have not i should have said that before because i know he's like just commented on it uh but if you are uh going through they go through some trials to try to find the holy grail 
And each one is there because they think they have a different, they each have a different reason for why they want to be a part of it. You know, Rogue Son is, uh, is being controlled by somebody else right now and is like, I have to stop the ultimate darkness from coming into the world. Uh, the Radiance Black are struggling with who is going to be, they've been told that one of them has to choose. They have to choose who they're going to be. Are there multiples be. of them? There are. Oh, I thought it was just it one was. called Radiant Black. It oh. Was and that's I'm trying this really hard not to <laughs> go into that. There is technically only one radiant black, but I can't tell you why there's two without spoiling radiant black. Well, it's two. So there is not technically four. only one, but there is two. There could be millions. There's two. I and actually I, don't know. I'm not there's <laughs> there's only two. There are two radiants black, but there is only supposed to be one, and so they is have radiance plural. They <laughs> did plural. They are plural. That's the way they are referring to it. They are pluralizing radiance and not black, which I appreciate. Oh. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and so uh, they are, I appreciate them doing yeah, that. absolutely. And there are two of them, and it's very quintessential to the Radiant Black story. So if you're reading it, you know why. If you're not reading it, you will learn, and it is very emotional. And they now have to choose who is going to be the, the Radiant Black. And so they are hoping that the Holy Grail will have this magical power that will help them uh, both be able to contain the power or choose um and of course dead lucky is here because she wants to save all of her people that are her ghosts that she's been carrying around with her um and so there's a and then there's a new character that has come into this story specifically ho like hunting for the holy grail and they are all working together and it's just kind of your classic if you stick in the indiana jones like quest for the holy grail and put it into the massive verse universe this is essentially what you get and they even make that joke like marshall one of the radiance black is like okay well indiana jones had to do this next so is that what we're gonna do and then they walk into the room and he's like called it like so they know that they are essentially just giving you that quest book but they put it in the massive verse universe and this is your lead in to the fact that kyle higgins has has said we're gonna see a lot of those big moments that have been teased and all of these coming to a head soon and so we are leading towards that now and you can definitely feel the tension mounting for each of those characters um i Honestly, for me, what I got out of this is I hope that this means we're getting a second volume of Dead Lucky soon because I thought that was a beautiful story. So um, I can't wait, and I hope that it does. And I'm happy to see Dead Lucky actually get, like, an official welcome to the Massive Verse universe because when it first came out, we were like, this isn't Massive Verse, but it looks like it. And then by issue three, they had rebranded it as Massive Verse. So I'm very glad that we are finally actually giving them that time. So what is that? Yes, oh, I have these. Ooh, look at these. Nick's gonna cry when I show these. Uh, this is Dead Lucky number one at 9 8 Slam. Cover A. Cover A. And this is Dead Lucky number one, cover B in a 9 8. So if you are a fan of Dead Lucky like me and you need some beautiful artwork to display on your wall, this is the way to do it. Um, so thank you for, I didn't even know we had this. So. Those are the new slabs that just came in. <laughs> also, getting slabs for real cheap. Basically for cost, almost. Nick just said, W2F, hold on. <laughs> so, I'll just put those in Nick's box. <laughs> and, uh, they, how much were they? You said cheap. 40 they were and 40, 35. 40 and 35? 40? Cover A was 40. Uh, cover B was 35. There you go. Look, look Phil's on it. Um, all right, we're going to get ridiculous for a minute. Um, we've got... Biden's Titans, which has become a series that everybody loves to enjoy. Uh, Biden's Titans versus Elon Musk, issue one from Keen Spot. And I actually had this originally as one of my one shots, but I did remember that this actually does end on a cliffhanger. So for the first time, Biden's Titans might actually roll into an issue two. Um, Biden's Titans is a companion series to what used to be called Trump's Titans. So if you, and, and it's all one shots. Um, Keen Spot did a really incredible job of making 2020 uh, political books for everybody, uh, for literally everybody, and they're apolitical. They make fun of all of the people at all times, and uh, now Biden's Titans is the team up of Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, um, Pete Pete Buttigieg and uh, Superior AOC, as she is known in the Biden's the the Keen Spot universe, and in this particular issue, they have learned that Elon Musk has taken over Twitter and he is trying to mind control people through it. 
and they, the destruction of the universe might come from this. And so they are trying to come up with their plan. And a certain actor appears to them dressed as Gambit, who has the ability to act, and his name is one Johnny Depp. And Johnny Depp has come to help Biden's Titans take down Elon Musk uh, from taking over Twitter. What's great about this is that Elon Musk bought bought Keenspot in the process of this book being developed. And so Elon Musk uh, says all of the editorial commentary on it and is like, I don't think I like this. I don't know where this is going. I'm not a fan of this story. And like, does that never happen when they reference like real things that actually happen? Um, this is the truest form of parody and satire in the whole wide world. And again, it's apolitical. It is making fun of everybody. Their whole um, strategy is that AOC is no, and they all know that Elon Musk is worried that nobody loves him because he, they have the scene where he actually did go on Dave Chappelle's like live stage and everybody booed him. That's in here. And so they realize that like Elon Musk thinks that nobody uh, likes him. So their whole thing is that, uh, um, AOC is going to fall in love, like make him fall in love with her and tell him that she's fallen in love with him and they're going to, they're going to fall in love. The best thing is actually, oh, it's a lie. Um, the best thing is, is that, um, when they go, their, their team of people who are helping them is Elon Musk's evil exes and check out Grimes, guys. Grimes is a character in this book and, uh, she's down here <laughs> and it's, so fantastic. And then uh, Grimes is a character. Uh, Amber Heard is a character in here. And she has poop powers. Um, everything that you hear on the internet comes to play into Biden's Titans. And they, this is people who literally spend their time on the internet and look for all of the best memes and then turn them into a comic story. But there is a cliffhanger because this plan does not play out the way they think there's going to be. And uh, we are going to get... Biden's Titans versus the superior AOC in the next issue, um, which she has always been. And we had the return of um, one Bernie Sanders in here who is trying to save Alexandra before it is too late. So um, he's, that's like all he cares about is you know, AOC must be saved. It's fantastically hilarious, honestly. Like, do not go in looking for your, like, Oscar story. Go in looking to laugh at everything. I love that there's even, like, an Elon Musk uh, as Magneto, like, cover. Yeah. Like, there was so so many good covers. I was holding this book. Like, anytime I had this book out this week to put up on the wall, somebody would be like, what is that? And I would tell them, and they'd be like, I'll just take it. And so the book, like, never made it completely to the wall because every time I tried to put it out, somebody would just buy it. And I hope you all had a really good laugh. Um, this week while reading this book because it's hilarious. Um, up next, we have Feeder Issue 1 from Sumerian Comics. Uh, go for it. Yes, uh, this is your action star uh, Lee Kid, who was known as the Royal. He's made millions of movies as this character. The Royal has a bunch of like cheesy action lines. Uh, and as, as one, as it has happened in reality, uh, he tried to branch out and do more than that, and his acting career completely fell apart. And now he is uh, a hitman. He's not. They're not called hitman. What uh, enforcers? Yeah, he's an enforcer for his agent, going around and collecting money. And I love the opening scene in this um, when he's talking to this guy who's like, oh, please don't kill me. And he's like, well, here's the thing. I'm not the guy that comes to collect the money. And then he blows money with a shotgun. It, it's it, I was like, OK, where, wherever this book's going, I'm in. Uh, and then you kind of start to see his like backstory. Um, there's another character um, his agent brings in these two people who are like, oh, yeah, we're going to. Uh, we're going to make another royal movie. And he's like, oh, uh, I wasn't expecting that. But okay, yeah, sure. Uh, and then at the end of this issue, we also get to see uh, how his demise came to be. Um, he decided to branch out and make like an artsy kind of dramatic film. It flops and he becomes a pariah in Hollywood. And everyone's like, oh, just go like you're a one trick pony. Just go back. And he's like, ah, I really don't want to. Um, and, and so what we get is the backstory and then of course where our character, 
uh, is now and what you're going to expect from this book. Uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, it is Sumerian, so I'm like already leaning towards, yeah, sure, whatever this is. Um, but I do like this because he's one of those action stars that's like doesn't really want to be in that world anymore, doesn't want to continue with uh, the action stuff, but somehow they still kind of rope him into it. Uh, but yeah, I thought this was a strong first issue. Um, I like a lot of the characters, and um, I'm excited to see where this story actually goes. Uh, so yeah. I had to look it up because I knew I recognized his art. He did the Argus and Haywire. And so both with Haywire oh, okay. was, you know, the Lost Souls, which we really okay. loved that one shot. Yeah. He's the same artist as that. I just had to look that up right now because I was like, I have cannot figure out where I know this art style from. Yeah. And that is the artist of both of those books, which makes sense. And I love it because it's just this is just Bruce Willis down on this look. Pretty much. Like yeah. uh, turned into like this, you know, if Bruce Willis had become an enforcer for somebody. Uh, yeah, if his dramatic roles didn't pan out. What was that? He was he did that Disney movie. The kid. Yeah. Oh, man, I love if that the movie. kid didn't pan out. Thank God it did though. I know. <laughs> I mean, he's most known for that. If anything. <laughs> Definitely the not. The kid. It was a good movie. It was a good it, movie. It was a fly under the radar. Great movie. Right. Might have actually been considered a flop. Not sure, but. Uh, I feel like in Disney's terms, it has. I mean, been in a Disney's flop. terms, it was definitely. But it was a good. It was a fun movie. Um. Up next, we have Within Temptation, issue one, from Opus Comics. This is uh, the newest Opus title. And um, I'm sure that this is a, a metal band. That's what I was going to look Thank up. you, because I'm sure it says it on the inside, and I already forgot. But this is the story of a, a girl who is a soldier, and she is adamant that she protects her people. Her people have been... Um, not like not getting the recognition, not getting the protection from like their empire, um, of everybody else, or as they call it, the, the mother. And she ends up going into this, and like they come to her and they're like, We're gonna take you in because you're the best soldier, and we want to take you to the main city, and we want to show you what it's like, and we want to have you experience the mother like firsthand. And she's essentially like selected to 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 take on a, a special role and she's like I don't I don't want this I just want to be with like I need my people I need my allies here I need my soldiers that I fight with I need to be a part of the battle lines I don't want this and they kind of force her into this role whether she wants it or not and um it's it's kind of really beautiful where it goes um and kind of crazy at the same time but uh honestly like this was a really good story and I want to see um I would love to see more from it and you have it, so you know where it's from. It is a band called Within Temptation. Uh, they are a modern rock and metal band with crossovers to many genres like urban, trip, alternative, punk, hip-hop, mysterious, modern, <laughs> cinematic, and action-driven music. They opened for Evanescence in 2020. Makes sense. Makes sense for Opus. Mm -hmm. And currently, uh, or they opened for Iron Maiden in 2022. Still makes sense wow. for Opus. Wow. Still makes sense for okay. Opus, yeah. Still no Iron Maiden. Well, you know, we don't know what Opus has in the works. Oh, man. I would not be I mean, surprised if we trooper. see an Iron Ma Maiden comic. You just do a whole book on the Trooper. Yeah. You've got to give or us. Or whatever their mascot's name is. Eddie. Yeah, Eddie. Yeah, just make an Eddie comic. Oh, I would People be surprised. Nuts for that. I'm sure I like Opus already, is working on. It might already exist. Too. I don't think so. I did notice that uh, the other band that has a comic out, Hammerfall. Yeah, they they're touring right now mm -hmm. with Halloween. What? Those two bands are together Halloween on is tour. a great comic. <laughs> Legacy of the Beasts was the title of the comic book. Oh, that's right. They did uh, do the Legacy of the Beasts uh, one. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ram said he's been jamming to Within Temptation for years. So. Oh, really? Yeah, thanks, Ram. See, I always know. I, I like Ram. I need to just start sending the covers to Ram and be like, "Who is this band?" Because he knows all of them. He is like my Opus Comics expert at this point. Um, yeah, Absolutely. I know the target audience for Opus Comics is Halloween Ram. Within Temptation, right? And. Again, Halloween, Secret of the Keys, man. That is a great book. Have you still, have you listened to them, though? No. I don't know They're anything They're about that. 
I don't know 95% of the bands that Opus has made comics for, but I am in for Opus Comics. I think the new rule is, is when you read an issue one, you have to listen to the band. I don't know that I want to do that, because I know that I like the comics, but I'm not a metal fan. Well, then every time a new issue comes out, I will come in and play whatever the band is. I will sit and listen to their discography and find the best songs... And, and I'll go. bring them to you. Okay, good. Yeah, you're driving around all day. You listen to it and find the song I you listen think to I would like. I listen to a ton of music. I listened to five U2 albums today. Well, congratulations. <laughs> that was since yesterday. First you five records so today. Proud. So, yeah, I listen to a lot of music. I'm so proud of you. Aww. I want a Skeleton Witch comic. That would be cool. Because they've toured with Halloween. Yeah, you know, I like their music a lot. I just like the name Skeleton Witch. So let's awesome. make a comic they make out of awesome that. Awesome music. Yeah, it's like kind of like classic rock. Yeah, sounding metal. Am I gonna classic. like it? I mean, it's like ACDC. If I AC/DC do like ACDC. Was a little bit more riffy. Okay. Yeah. I might. I yeah. might like it. We'll see. I if you we'll make stream. a comic called Skeleton yeah. Witch, I'm. I mean, I'd be in. So <laughs> like. And they've got cool imagery from what I remember. I remember them having like really cool album covers. We are going to talk about imagery and metal music in our picks of the week. Oh, okay. Um, but until I then, love metal music, we so. have uh, one more new one, and it is kind of a one shot because it's a non stop, but this is Drexler number one from Scout Comics. Yes, uh, I. I like the nonstop concept. Uh, it gives you a chance to read that first issue, sort of like a preview in a way. Yeah. Um, and uh, this one is is interesting because you have um, some small town murders. Children are getting murdered in a small town by what we think could be aliens, could be a monster. Definitely not a human Mm-mm. that's killing these kids. Uh, but then we also jump to uh, this character, Drexler, who is sort of a mercenary for hire who teams up with, like, different government agencies uh, to go in and, and help them with missions. He's got this cool, like, teleportation device uh, that that he uses, and, and you get to see him um, go in and, and steal something. He's trying to get a weapon or a microchip. Um, from these bad guys, and you get to see him fight them. Uh, and then when he's done, he's like, all right, I'm going to go hide this weapon somewhere until somebody shows up to get it. Uh, and then I'm going to go see my sister, who is a cop in this small town. Uh, and he shows up and is like, oh, hey, there's these crazy murders going on. I guess I'll go and check them out and, and help you guys figure out what's going on. And... Uh, he shortly after that uh, finds out what is going on yeah. and uh, who what is behind uh, the murders of these kids so far. And I, I mean, I I'm definitely intrigued. I, I like that he as when he returns back to this town, there's a group of people that already don't like him. So he's already got enemies in this town. Um, there's some family issues uh, that they kind of hint at in this first issue as well. Um, but they set up some really interesting stuff because it's like he does all these really – he does like these really cool missions. Also like interplanetary mm-hmm. travel could be a thing. Mm-hmm. They kind of hint at that. Uh, and yet it seems like there's a possibility that this whole story could be contained in a small town. Yeah. Uh, when you have the whole universe to play with. So I'm very intrigued to see where this goes. Um, and I'm almost excited that it, I, I think I am excited that it is a nonstop because I now want to read the whole story in one sitting. I definitely do. And I, like you said, I love that format. I love that there's a chance to check out a book and then say, you know what, give me the trade. Yeah. And I, I think that Scout does a great job with that. And this is one where, you know, sometimes the nonstops come in and I'm like, you could have made this single issues and I would yeah. be okay with the episodic nature of it. This is one where, like you, I'm like, you know what? I want that trade. Like, mm-hmm. just just sign me up for the trade. Let's go for it. And I can't wait for it to come out. Yeah, me. Yeah, me too. I, I think it's it's a ton of fun. I want to see a lot more of his like power. It's not a power set, but I want to see more of him using his like tech. Yeah, his yeah. like futuristic tech. Um, and of course, he's got like this cool mask with the double guns. Like it's stuff he's a that cool I'm. Character. Yeah, he's a cool character. 
You know, if there was an action figure, I'd buy one. It's Scout, so don't don't put it past them to make an action figure for it. I mean, you look, know, I I used to buy a lot of a lot of action figures that just came with two guns and, and the costume. And you know what, Scout Phil and I constantly talk about how we would like to do a live show from your location in Fort Myers. So if you're watching, we will there. drive the hour <laughs> to go one Friday when you're off, just show up here and be like, let's go. And I'll be All like, right. okay, let's go. Because we want to do, a, we, we've already done, I've already done a, a live like look through there. But I mean, I know you have your podcast room. So if you would be willing to let Phil and I do a show from there, Scout. We will make the hour drive to come down and do it and talk about how great you are. The whole I'll time. just talk about it. We'll just, we'll do, just do a scout, scout show. I'll we'll just do all the scout only do a scout books. show. Yeah. We could do this show for as long as we do this show just about scout books without even yeah. a problem. Like, we have such a love for scout. Uh, we we used, um, I don't know if you know, we had a Story School Anchors yesterday, which is our kids' book club, which is free to join. I had a person call me on the phone yesterday and ask about it. It is actually free to join the Story School Anchors, and the coolest thing is is that kids get one free book and, uh, a month and a 10% discount on anything they purchase Dang. anytime. Kids are, like, living the dream with the Story Spelunkers program. But yesterday, our free book that we, we read out loud as a group, we, like, acted out the book, was The Misadventures from the Scoot imprint. Okay, And nice. we, we got to have an awesome time reading that. Everybody got to play a character at the table. So oh much fun, gosh. and then we, we made could do fantasy like a, table. We could uh, like fantasy a whole maps. hour just on Scoot. Just on Scoot alone. Oh my god, I love Scoot. I have a Scoot hoodie. Like I am that person. I am the reason they make adult size Scoot hoodies. I actually went to the Scout store and was like, "Where are your adult size Scoot hoodies?" And they were like, <laughs> yeah. "We never thought of that." And I was like, "Well, you'll sell one." I am the one. <laughs> I want a Scoot hoodie, and then they made them, and then I ordered it, and they were like, "Shannon, we got you. It's on its way." Um, we love you. Thank you for caring about Scoot so much. And I was like, oh, thank you for making amazing kids books. Um, and the Story Spelunkers love them too. And we already talked about next month's Story Spelunkers book. It's probably going to be a uh, Sinji and Simbo. And so we're super excited nice. to do another Scoot book next month. So just saying, it's going to be awesome. And if you're a publisher of books, you should make single issues for kids because I have a ton of kids, sub kids subscribers who want more single issue comics. Um, I think that we entered a world for a while there where, like, kids' graphic novels were the number one thing carrying the publishing industry. Like, that is a thing. I worked in publishing. We would go to Children's Institute, and they would say kids' graphic novels were the number one thing. But as a comic store owner in a store that is kid kid forward, so many kids come in, and they're like, do you have this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, and I show them a graphic novel, and they're like, but do you have a comic of it? And they want that single issue. They want to subscribe to it. I'm seeing so many kids who are like, I want to get this book every time it comes out. And we're we're starting to see kids hitting that point where they've read all those graphic novels and now they're just into comics. And they want comics that are made for their age range that they're allowed to pick up. But they like that floppy version of them. So give us some more floppy books for kids because uh, kids are loving them. All right, we got Picks of the Week coming your way. And um, there are uh, there's one for each of us, including Matt, this week, and uh, one that we probably all would agree on together. So um, up first, I'm gonna go first because I'm obsessed with this book, and it is The Neighbors, issue three from Boom Studios. And the tagline of this is it's underneath us, and yet we still know nothing about what's going on underneath us. So um, this. This brings me those autumnal fills. Um, you know, the autumnal is one of my favorite comic books of all time. This brings me those same kind of feelings of that slow-moving sense of dread. Um, this is about a family who um, moves to a small town because one of the parents isn't okay with going outside because they are in the process of transitioning and they feel like everybody is judging them and, and, and looking at them and they're just really become kind of agoraphobic to the outside world. And so they move to this small town and the second they get to this small town, they find out that there's some really creepy stuff happening in this town. Like they have the neighbor lady who's 
weird and old, like the old witch lady who's doing weird stuff on the side, like with the snakes and stuff, like you see when you go to a, a small town um, in these horror movies and books and things. And on the very in the very first issue, the oldest daughter, who is the stepdaughter of, of this person, um, goes outside in the middle of the night and they are something happens to them. We don't know what it is. We still have no idea. But ever since then, they are essentially possessed by whatever is happening in this town. And the thing that makes this book phenomenally done is that the artwork is so good at the little tells and the little, you know, a thing that makes a good horror movie is those those close-ups. What is it that you're zeroing in on? And this comic does that. I was showing Phil earlier, there's a scene where we see like the jawline and then we see the up close of the smile and then we see the pan out and the kid's just like normal all of a sudden in the pan out, but in all those close-ups, everything was really creepy. And it gives you an eerie feeling the whole time that you're reading this book. And yet at the same time, nothing's really happened. And it makes your main character feel like they're going crazy and it makes you feel like you're worried about nothing. But you know something bad is coming because you've seen a little bit more than anybody else as a reader. And yet, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, gosh, it's so good. This is the same artist who did volume two of House of Slaughter, which is my favorite volume of House of Slaughter. And I realize now that 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 art style lends so well to horror in a way that I wasn't expecting. And um, God, this book is so good. And if you haven't started reading it yet, it's only on issue three, so you can still jump in. And I know Boom said to us earlier this year that they were gonna slow down on how many titles they were pushing out and kind of try to focus in on really giving us great titles. And if this is what you mean by that, 100% you're nailing it. Boom. This is fantastic and definitely my pick of the week. Um, but up next, we have We Are Scarlet Twilight, number one from Red 5, which I guess I should say the eyes are nominated Red 5 because The Atonement Bell was nominated for Best New Series. But yes. um, what? tell me what Scarlet Twilight is, We Are Scarlet Twilight is, Phil, because I know you love this book. Yes, this was my pick of the week. I knew it was going to be because there's one word on this, uh, on this uh, front cover that says it all, and it's pulp. <laughs> I don't love it in my orange juice, but I love it in my storytelling. Uh, this I is... I, it's just I, the texture. I think <laughs> ultimate, it's a texture thing for me. There. Uh, so uh, we have uh, our pulp hero is Captain Lancet, who has got the cool costume. He's got the ray guns. And he is out trying to prevent his city, Old Manhattan. Uh, oh, I love this page here where he's like jumping through the glass. Oh, so great. It's so good looking. Uh, he is trying to prevent his city from being overtaken by this cult called Scarlet Twilight, uh, who is led by Madame Satanica, which is such a great name. And there's also like one of her henchmen is like Dr. Occulto and stuff. Um, and so we see uh, Captain Lancet uh, fighting some of her henchmen while he's going around and trying to see uh, what she's up to. Uh, he wants to know how he can find her. And we get sort of a, a little change from your typical pulp story uh, because he reveals uh, to this doctor uh, that it wasn't his ray guns that saved him from nerve gas. It is the fact that he is a vampire. Mm -hmm. uh, and he turns into a vampire at one point and shows off his true form. <laughs> it looks awesome. I love that shot, too. Yes. You have it open right now where the guy's like, oh! Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, it's, it's something that you wouldn't expect. Um, and so, and what's great, too, is then he's like, oh, uh, Madame Satanica is going to be at this, this gala and so then you learn of his alter ego, uh, Prince Vlad Kingsley, um, you know, the Prince Playboy uh, that everyone loves. He's got his driver, very Bruce Wayne-esque in a way. Um, and I love that he's a prince, too. And he goes to this gala and he thinks that maybe this princess that he's seen is, is potentially Madame Satanica. 
And it's actually The Reporter, which I wasn't expecting either, um, which is just great. It's It's got all those, like, pulp tropes that you you want to see, uh, but with a little twist. Uh, and so he goes in to um, attack Madame Satanica and uh, ends up biting her, which is just like, okay, so this is just... You, you're pretty like at, at first I was like is this a one shot right and then the last few pages changes the story entirely and we get a four part series yes changes this story entirely I was not expecting like I just thought this was going to be this like I, I almost show the last few pages because it, it's really intriguing like I kind of want to but I'm not going to um uh because yeah you're like oh this is going to be your classic pulp story and it's just Right, you get to the end of the classic pulp story, and then there's still like five more pages, and you're like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, and because it even and what I I do love about this is it's like, oh, uh, be prepared to see the next adventures next month, and then you flip to the page, and you're like, "Oh wait, it's still going." I was like, "Is this a preview for issue two? And it's like, "No, it's not. No. This story is not actually over. It's going to take a different turn." I thought that was a great way to do that too. Like yeah. it gave you like the the teaser, like, "Oh, the next issue, like the mm-hmm. classic wrap up of a story," and then that wasn't the end. And I thought, like, "Oh wow, okay, so you're you're giving me." more and you're showing me that this is more than what you thought but yeah I almost stopped reading there and I think it's a good thing that you brought that up because I almost stopped reading there thinking yeah. it was a spoiler for like a, a preview for issue two and mm-hmm. I hate to read previews but I was like no this is still the story I'm so glad I didn't skip the end of this because it's like it's like when you get to the end of Captain America the the first adventure Marvel movie and you think like it's over and that's like actually the only one of the cutscenes that continues the story. Right. This kind of felt like that like you know, we got to see what happens next. Yeah. Yeah. I I loved everything about this book. It it ticked all the boxes that I needed it to tick. Um and Red 5. Yeah, we action need- figures. This is an action figure. As I was saying, the double guns. He's got the double guns there. They're ray guns. The I mean, costume I'm still waiting for cool. mega action figures. We're gonna yeah. Talk about five about action yeah. figures. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I. It, it gave me everything that I needed in an issue one. And seeing that it's one of four already bums me out. Yeah. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll get two volumes. Um, up, up next is actually Matt's pick of the week, which we very rarely talk about. But I read this book and I immediately came downstairs and handed it to Matt. Um, but we're only going to show you the first half because the second half is probably not. I don't want to show you because I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil it. It's it's intense and you need to be prepared for it. I, and you got to read to get to I it. I do also want to say that if you are a lover of animals, this book has imagery that could trigger you yes uh it's depressing to look at yes but it's actually the money of this book and things like that do go towards and they want you to support people to protecting animals uh but this is called here comes calico and it 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 might just be called called calico Calico? because it's not here comes daredevil right so it might just be calico uh, it might just be Calico. It is labeled a mature, explicit content because it does have it is a, a lot of very explicity. mature. Um, and this is issue one. It's from Sigma Comics, and literally this entire book exists to remind you that animal cruelty is bad. Um, this is a superhero who dresses up kind of in a similar costume to Black Panther. And good luck, I know, showing some things. But this is the story of a, of a man who has made his whole entire superhero identity about stopping people who attack uh, the last of a species or endangered or near extinct animals. And so he gets these reports that come in about people who are big game hunting or things like that. And even just like these kids who like these like punk kids who attacked a dog on the street, he gets these reports coming in and he goes after them. And this particular issue um, is the story, you do get his backstory, like, flashed in there, but this is the story of him going after a family that Big Games hunts together, and specifically, they go after a lioness who has cubs, and they kill the lioness, and they are trying to sell all of the cubs off to different people, and he feels it's his responsibility to basically be the punisher for those people, in, uh, like, a Garth Ennis, or 
yeah, Garth Ennis max level Punisher level of um, of torture to these people who have been cruel to animals. That's all I can show. And uh, and so. <laughs> you could show the opening page, but oh, so this no. is this is this That's is a trigger, him. I think. No, oh, this is him going after those. So again, like he said, if you if you don't want to see, there are going to be scenes where he gets the information about what they did to the animals. So sees you might videos. see like he because he sees videos and he talks about how triggering they are for him, which I do appreciate hearing yeah. him say that. Um, so there are those videos in there, but if you are also somebody who's like. If somebody is going to mess with animals, I'm going to mess with them. This is the superhero you've been waiting for because he gives you all of that. And at, like, Sigma Comics, their tagline is justice for all. And they are very much like, let's give the Punisher a voice in all of the capacities of things. And um, this one's animal cruelty. And there are multiple pages in here that tell you how you can donate to help protect animals. So please do. Um, If you buy this book, please also... Then turn around and make the same three ninety nine donation um, at least to protecting animals because that is what they are hoping you will do. I agree. Yeah, that's uh, that's I I I like animals more than I like people, uh. So to see this book and and how violent he is towards people and he's pretty much just like they don't need to exist at all. Yeah, is like, all right. <laughs> Uh, I, also too, I felt very much, uh, like this was in the style of like a nineties image yeah. book, um, with the art style, the dialogue and just kind of how the story's written. So also if you're a fan of nineties image, I think this is like yeah. content wise, something that you would really enjoy. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, overall just like, it's crazy. It, the second half of that book, I'm just like. Whoa. It got way further got than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that like every hero has a catchphrase and his is literally just run. Right. His just, just run. They even print on the cover of the book, like run, and I was like, oh. Ooh. That's what Superman should do. Oof. Um you, no, shut up. You like Superman <laughs> because he's a good person. Um, I don't know if I want to see Superman. We don't doing want to what see Superman do this. No, there's a, a space for heroes of all kinds and superman needs to stay good and wholesome and this guy needs to be here and do his thing i i I will say also too i look forward to the origin issue because he mentions the suit that he has yeah and he did give us a little bit of his like ultimate backstory like when he was a kid but we're definitely going to see more of that coming yeah more like like quick flashbacks yeah where it's like i want to see because there's definitely some of those flashbacks i'm like i want to see how this ends yeah um but yeah it's I'm very intrigued by where this is going to go. Mm-hmm. And For if sure. there's going to be like a full blown story in eight issues. In it, right. It's eight issues. So or I am I just going to see eight issues of you just brutally torturing and murdering? <laughs> and like either way, I'm still going to pick it up either way. <laughs> like, um, and honestly, I, I was telling Matt and Phil earlier, like these guys were at Megacon and I almost stopped and told them I ordered issue one. And after reading issue one now, I really regret not stopping and being like, hey, I ordered issue one. Where are you going with this? Because uh, it wasn't out yet so I was like I don't know what I think about it because I don't even know what it's about and now that I've read it I'm like oh man I wish I would have had a conversation with these people for sure here's the thing the story doesn't really have to go anywhere because I like the message Um, but what I would say is is there's like one torture that he does I won't say what it is because I can't talk about it but there's one torture in specific where it's in the next seven issues Give me something more creative each time. Ooh. You know, like one up the torture <laughs> as you go. That's um, intense. That's gonna get intense. Look, you came out the gate. You did. You hard. started it. You started it. <laughs> you came out like crazy first issue where I was you like, did. oh, maybe he's gonna warm up to it. No. And he's like, nope. Nope. I mean, he warmed up to it, no, but... <laughs> I don't feel like he it's did. Cold. Oh, no. There was warming. Oh, there was warming. There was, there was, there was warming. It got there hot. There was heat. It got hot. It got hot. Got, got yeah, hot it went fast. from hot to, or cold to hot real fast, but like, whoo, did it get there? 
Uh, yeah, so if you want to protect animals and you're willing to do anything to do so, read Calico. Um, lastly is an issue we have all been waiting for, and I'm really sad that we don't have the wine that goes with this to drink mm. tonight. But the uh, last pick of the week is Frank and Rocker and the Gel Bait Punks, issue four from Bad Kids Press, which does have its own wine, but we can't have it here in Florida because they can't sell it to us across the state lines or ship it to us across state lines, which is a shame because I need to drink it. Wait, why not? You can't bring, unless you have a distribution like thing and you're like a major corporation, you can't ship alcohol state to state. So because like they made it, like, like you can't. But I've, sh- I've purchased. But that's because they have distribution rights across state lines and it's really hard to get. Oh, you can't really. have alcohol mailed to you. Yeah. Like, so they can't mail it directly to us. They'd have to mail it to a store that was willing to carry I, it. And you I deliver a mail all the time. Yeah, but those are like wine clubs or things like that yeah, that they order true. from. They're not a part of a wine club. Well, the, I've looked into this. Florida does have a laxer law towards it, um, but it's all, it's it's just, it's all, spec, it's all debate, debatable by state. Okay. So I've looked into this a lot because. Because I've bought limited beer. That are done by, like, breweries in other states. And they have to have a certain, like, distribution thing to do that. Weird. Yeah. You're not supposed to be able to ship it. Like, I ordered a, a oh, my God, was the beer from Jaws? Uh, Matt's not here anyway. He just left. I ordered some of that for Matt because they did a specialty one um, in the Northeast. Like, in Martha's Vineyard, like, they made a, um, a specialty version, like, as an anniversary. They reprinted the original cans, and they had to actually drain it before they could ship it to me, so all I got was the cans. Which, cool. they sell that beer here in Florida, so now we've just had it. Oh, okay. um, but we had not had it until then. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you, can, you can't actually. It's like a whole thing. There's so many laws around shipping alcohol, so they can't actually ship it to us. But I talked to them at Comics Pro. and I, Anyway, I'm very excited. Frank Rocker and the Jailbait Punks is out. We've been talking about beautiful coloring all night. Yes. Uh, this is a great one, but Raul Torres has uh, given us a, a fantastic story the whole way through. I know this has been... I think issues one through three were all picks of the week as well. Probably. Probably. And if not, it was that, oh, it should be, but But we already have too many other picks of the week. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, it teeters on that. But yeah, it it is. And also, too, it's been a while. Yes, it's been, we've been on hold for a while. So tell them what it's about for those who don't know. Yes, so this is the story of a punk band that is led by Frankenstein's Monster. He is the lead singer of this awesome punk band. Uh, well, not so awesome. They're kind of like your loser punk band that plays in rundown clubs. And they are called upon by the Greys, you know, your typical Grey aliens, uh, who are battling reptilians. And so they are called to um, their planet to uh, help the Greys fight the reptilians. And they become these awesome warriors who uh, end up helping them. But uh, at, in this issue... Uh, we find out that the reptilians have sort of a plan B, and that is to bring in a black metal band called Hate Goat, which is a fantastic band name for a black metal band. Uh, and they have brought them in to do a battle of the bands with Frank and Rocker. So Frank and Rocker has to do something that they don't do very often, which is rehearse uh, and try and play good punk music. Which, by the way, a lot of like early punk bands were bands that didn't know how to play their instruments very well, and they just kind of like sort of learned on the go. And the messiness of it is, I think, what appealed to a lot of people early on. Page. Um, yeah, I mean, the the panel layouts um, in this issue are fantastic. Uh, so yeah, you end up seeing them battle against. Uh, Hate Goat, who, you know, has the makeup and the great stage performances with candles and pentagrams and all sort of awesome things that you would expect from from a metal band. It's like going and seeing Ghost, you know, like... But it's black metal. Is this what you just taught me about? Okay, so I thought so. I just learned about black metal, like, in detail this week and, like, all these bands that, like, did crazy things that were black metal bands... So reading this right after learning all that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so funny to me because now I know like the entire history of black metal because Matt and Alan taught me, our subscriber Alan taught me about black metal this week. 
And I was like, I'm so happy that they did that, not knowing that this was going to be, like, the lesson I needed before I read this comic book. See, comics are educational, everybody. What, um, you, what you need to get into is the German black metal. Those dudes were crazy. What were we? We were no, Norwegian, right? Which we're, is the original. Norwegians are crazy, too. But there's, like, uh, there's a, a German black metal band called Burzum. And one of them... He's Norwegian. He's Norwegian. He's, the, he's Norwegian? Burzum is Norwegian. And he's the guy who played bass for Mayhem, who ended up killing the guitar player. Yeah. Who was the main guy of Mayhem. And then they put him on the album cover. That was all Norwegian. And the guy who was on the album cover was the singer, whose name is Dead. And Dead yeah. shot himself in the head. That's the one, yeah. And then they uh, put it on the... Eponymous or whatever is the guitar player who took all the pictures for the album cover. And then Burzum killed Eponymous. And Burzum came out to be a complete anti-Semite, racist, terrible person and went to jail. And now does YouTube videos because you're allowed to YouTube in jail for some reason. And, I thought they uh, were all dead. racist... No, no, no. Burzum's still alive. I learned about this this week. Yeah, I went See? down the rabbit hole. He went down the rabbit hole, and then Alan already knew that. We all talked about and it. They encouraged church people to blow up churches, which is and crazy. So like Fourteen churches were set on fire or blown because up because of this in band. The time of mayhem. So then I read this comic, That's and I was crazy. like, "This all makes sense. Like, why you would choose a black metal band to be your person? Like, your your uh." What is it when you stand in for somebody in battle? Whatever. Those people. And I was like, oh, man, this is this is crazy. Like, I just assumed that that's supposed to be a representation of those people. Yeah. And so then I was like, Frankenstein's monster has to go against all these people with Frank and Rock and the Jailbait Punks. And, dude, oh, it was crazy. And, it, you know, <laughs> you could take the entire, you could take all the words out and you'd still get a great comic just because of this art. Yeah. But your words are so good, too, because, like you said, like, you've got the, oh, you got practice, oh, we got to do this. And, like, then they have, I love it because they have a battle of the bands to see who the winner is. And then they finish the battle of the bands and they're like, so who won? And the aliens are like, what do you mean? And they're yeah. like, well, what were the, like, you picked a winner, right? And they're like, no. And they're like, well, what were the guidelines? And they're like, I don't know. We figured y'all would tell us. And we're like. Uh, we, we, what? We don't know. It's your battle of the bands. How are we supposed to know what you're looking for in a winner? And they're like, you know what? Screw this. We're just going to be punk rock and we're just going to beat everybody up. And we're going to go with it from that. And I love this book. It's so great. Um, I love Bad Kids Press. They've never steered me wrong. Once again, this is a publisher that I'm happy to grab any title that they ever put out. But this one, just fantastic. Uh, whatever we see come next from from the creative team behind this and Bad Kids Press, we know we're going to do so. Um, cheers, Bad Kids Press, and all of the team of Frank and Rockers and Double Big Punk for uh, giving us such a great book. Yeah, also don't hesitate to make more. Yeah, we can do... Frankenrocker can keep going. Yeah, he can do other things. We can have... He can go fight somebody else now. And it's fine. Or just play music and be bad at it. We're good with that, too. All right. We got a lot of books that were in stock this week. Coming up first, we have Vanish Issue 7 from Image Comics and Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman. We've got Bishop War College Issue 4. We've got New Mutants Lethal Legion Issue 3. We've got Time Before Time, issue 23. Honestly, this is not a series I thought was going to be a 23-issue series, and we're still going. Wow. Uh, you know, I I'm so I thought that first arc was, like, really good and wrapped up, and then it just kept going, and it's still been a great story. Uh, 007 for King and Country, issue 2, for all of you Ian Fleming and 007 fans. Um, the Expanse, Dragon Tooth. Much like we talked about earlier for the Buffy fans, how the comics con- or the show continued in comics form, The Expanse is now picking up where it left off on the TV show in comics. Uh, the Exiled is out with yet another great uh, movie homage. This is Wesley Snipes' comic from Whatnot. DC Ruby, issue four. Also, um, there's an animated movie. There's an animated DC Ruby? Yes. Yeah. It came out uh, a couple months ago. Congratulations, Rooster Teeth. Yeah. Goodness it's, uh, gracious. I, I don't know much about Ruby. It's one of the few anime that I'm not too familiar with, but I enjoyed the movie. But as former Austinites, it's crazy to see Rooster Teeth be that big of a thing. Yeah. Um, that's insane to me. And Matt was there when they announced the very first uh, Ruby thing and was like, what is this thing? I don't know. Uh, and I used to live next door to Rooster Teeth. 
Justice Society of America issue four. Um, this is a relaunch of Midnight Western Theater, which was optioned. They are now reprinting the book in color, which is super cool. Um, I love Midnight Western Theater. Matt's freaking out right now. I couldn't read it because it was black. Um, so now it's going to come out in color and you can read it. So Midnight Western Theater was recently optioned. And so they are printing the whole thing again in color. And I'm super excited for Matt to read it now. Um, Rick and Morty issue five, uh, from the newest Rick and Morty series. The, there are so many. Static, uh, Shadows of Dakota issue four. And there is going to be a big universe opening up from Static coming soon, um, with Anasi getting a, a, a one shot, I believe. Uh, Tim Drake's Robin issue nine. Frank Frazetta's Dawn Attack issue four. Uh, this is something I'm really excited for. The new title from DC, City Boy, issue one. I love this cover. Also, one of the things I love is that all the AAPI titles that are being launched at DC, they are actually listing not only the titles, but the creators' names in the original characters on the covers yeah. and within the book. And I think that's great that they're giving um, so much representation to the AAPI community from all their titles. Um, we also have Green Arrow issue two. Look at this awesome. Roy Harper cover. That is nice. I know. I, I said that we have a subscriber who, one of our team subscribers who's obsessed with Roy. Literally, if you ever want to know the entire history of Roy, please talk to Aster. Um, but I sent him that cover before it ever came, like when I was doing the order, and I was like, do you want this? And he was like, shut up, like in all <laughs> caps. And I was like, I already ordered you a copy. Don't worry. Uh, Darth Vader, Black, White, and Red, issue two. The hottest book on the shelves. Uh, I found a copy. Don't you worry. Uh, Warlock Rebirth issue two out this week. Uh, Fury issue one. Nick Fury getting a series. And we are using that MC version of Nick Fury as the main character. Uh, I had some some t uh, like early 20-somethings in this week. And they were like, oh, I forgot Nick Fury looks different in the comics. I'm like, actually... The main continuity Nick Fury is actually essentially the Samuel L. Jackson Nick Fury now in comics. Here he is in his first issue. Um, the Excellent Issue 3. This is the second volume, so it's Legacy number 8 for the the uh, like the Excellent. And it is still the same creative team that did that first volume, so you still get that cool all-red art on it. X-Force Issue 40. Thor Issue 34. And this is that new Thor creative team. Um, Action Comics 1055, and we are looking at the Reign of Superman, Superman on that cover, uh, because Action Comics is now all of the super family, which I love that we're, estab we're actually establishing that there is a super family, you know, we've never really given the fact that there is a, a, a John Kent now, but there's also Connor Kent, and there is Steel, and there is Cyborg Superman, and there is... A, a power girl and super girl there is a super family we never give them like a bat family kind of book and action comics has now become that and i think that's super cool um hellcat issue three look at this gorgeous cover oh that's my gosh nice. uh and speaking of gorgeous covers harley quinn issue 30 with that jenny frizen cover it's a it's in box calm down it's there um unstoppable doom patrol issue three as a part of our dawn of dc and we launched daredevil and echo and this is the new taboo title taboo from the black ip has been writing comics for marvel this is taboo writing this and we've got some phil noto um art going on there former ringling student uh for all of you Bradenton, Sarasota people. Phil Noto is a graduate of the Ringling School, so let's, you know, support uh, our, our local people. Um, and then trade paperbacks in stock. We've got The Living Finger, which is essentially idle hands. This is nice. a guy finds a finger and he's like, gives the finger a name and like starts talking to it and then like realizes this finger wants a body. And so he gives, helps the finger find a body to attach to, and then it becomes um, possessed by the spirit of this finger, and it starts doing bad things. And he's like, I just want to live my life, but I'm, like, friends with you, but, like, I'm also, like, trying to live my life. And we get an idle hands kind of situation with him having to choose between, like, the crazy uh, sentient body part and um, real life. 
I'm here for it. I know. Me too. Uh, we've got Nocturne County. Speaking of nonstops from Scout, this is one that we love. This was the Dr. Seuss yeah. uh, told very adult version of Dr. Seuss um, crime story that we had. If you are just looking for a great laugh told entirely in rhyme, this is going to be the book for you. Definitely check it out. Um, Night of the Vegan. It's um, about to get undead and this is it's gonna be ridiculous i already know it's it's called night of the vegan things are only gonna be crazy in there um we've got volume one of of briar which is a christopher cantwell's retelling of sleeping beauty and she woke up and found out that the like prince didn't actually try to save her he took over her kingdom and now she is like you know what I'm here a hundred years later because I woke up when the curse ended and the whole world's gone to crap and I have to fix it. And, uh, you know, things just become a giant mess. But what if Sleeping Beauty picked up a sword and took care of herself for once is what we're going to get out of this. And lastly, we have this massive book, which is 20th Century Men. This is the entire story. I have been told numerous times by subscribers that this is one of their favorite stories that has happened. I have multiple subscribers who get every cover of this book because they absolutely adore the story. Um, so if you haven't picked it up yet, this is it in complete form. You can jump in um, and it's a great time to do just that um, because it's all up. It's right there. We also do have it in single issues for the most part, I think. Oh, nice. Um, and then... That's it. That's what we got out this week. There's a lot of new books that are going to hit the shelf this week. This is one of those five-week five, issue, five uh, week month, essentially, kind of things. So it was kind of a lull week, this like a small week this week. But this week coming up is going to be a huge week. I know you're all going to have fun tomorrow for Memorial Day. Don't Please don't forget what the holiday is actually about. And remember to honor the fallen um, while you're out there having fun. But... Wednesday, we will see you for new comic book day. There's going to be so many great titles. Uh, don't forget to pop over to our buddies at Mysterium Escape Rooms and check out their all new title, their all new game. Nick, you're here now. Um, if you're still in the chat, can you tell us a little bit for everybody who's interested about the new Wizarding World Escape Room that you have? Because I know that it is up and available for pre uh, for signups for people who want to do that new escape room so check that out please support local um and speaking of supporting local don't forget to check out Ascura's event calendar for this month they have incredible shows uh, emo night has a band a cover band this month but there is we were looking at it yesterday and almost all of the shows are free shows this yeah. month so you definitely want to go out and check out Ascura. um if you're local to Bradenton also know that uh, we have an extra uh, public market this month because usually it ends in May but we're adding one in for the one that was canceled because of Ian last year and this summer for the very first time the public market is going to do a last Saturday of the month market which we've never done yeah. before because usually this is our rainy season but they're actually going to try to do the last Saturday of June July and August with public markets so head out to downtown Bradenton and check out that public market if you haven't done it before because there's amazing vendors from all around the area that you're going to want to support and uh, definitely support local uh, in any capacity we're going to always post about our amazing friends in the old manatee community there's so many great businesses you should be checking out over here so always watch our instagram story for businesses that you can support in our community and great books that you should be checking out because this week i know there's a lot of good books coming out we will be talking about them uh, i will be talking about them on wednesday during our live five and then we will be talking about them again next sunday night at 9 p.m on facebook and then if you are a youtube person it'll be coming up to you later on that week so make sure you like and subscribe so you get the notification for when that video launches where we talk about all those small press and indie books that are coming your way uh until then we hope you have an awesome week. Have a safe and fun Memorial Day. Again, remember to honor the fallen throughout that. And as always, happy reading. Bye, everyone.